Okay, so I would like to open the Inland Wetlands Agency meeting of March 7th, 2022 at 7.02 um, p.m. And looking at our agenda, our first item is election of officers. Uh, and I assume that's all of us who are holding official positions, right? Because Lee, your secretary, is that right? I, uh, I'm not sure, I think so. <laughs> okay, so I'll entertain. I move we continue with the same slate of officers that have done such a great job last year and the year, be year before. I'll second that. All right, any discussion? Oh, where did somebody dropped off? Oh, John. Any discussion? All right. Well, it's the four of us. Oh, wait, Joe, you're we can't hear you. Are you talking? I'm not talking now. No, Joe, Joe's talking, but we yeah, he can't. He's muted or his air AirPods are in. I think it's not connected. Oh. Well, I'll second it. Okay, but we'll wait. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we'll let Joe try to. He's gonna figure it out. Or okay, we'll let him try and figure it out for a second, since he should probably have a say. So turn them on or. Set the sound on his computer, right? There's the two. All this high tech. Nope. You see your mouth moving. You're okay with everything? Okay. All right. Uh, I think he's, you're good. So, right, so you're okay? All right. So all in favor, just raise our hands nod. All right. Okay. So, um, great. We will continue on in our various roles. All right. So approval of the 2022 meeting calendar. And I don't have, do we need to share a link with that or just go through the dates? I can I'll, I'll pull that up for you. Sorry. No, that's okay. Sorry about that. Probably the easiest thing we'll have to do all night. <laughs> um, Kayla, it, it's the first Monday of every month. Right. Um, Except we usually have um, like July. September's, yeah, July, September. So April, it would be the fourth. May is the second. June 6th. July. That's going to be July 11th? Yes. Okay. August would be August 1st. And then. And then it, it, it continues. Yeah. Well, except September, September 12th. Uh, yes. September yeah. would be the 12th, I believe. Yeah. So September yeah. 12th, October 3rd. And yeah, right. we're good. We're good for everything. So um, the first Monday of every month, except for July, we'll do the July 11th. And September, we'll do September 12th. Sounds good. Everyone okay? Yeah, I move we approve the 2022 meeting calendar. I'll second it. All right. There's not a whole lot of discussion. All in favor? 
Raise our hand. Aye, aye. Okay. Just zipping, zipping through this agenda. <laughs> All right. So um, we have three. Well, John can talk about it, but we have on the agenda there are three um, applications for receipt. So the first application is 22 1256 Texas Road. Um, this is a property we visited before for a site walk. Um, it sounds like they want to remove a pool and replace it with a different pool. Um, but John, do you want to add any more information? Oh, but you're muted. <laughs> Good thing I was. <laughs> yeah, we've been doing this for two years. You think I almost, I almost out. choked. Um, okay, so the, the existing pool, uh, if you remember on the sidewalk, there was a pool there. <clears throat> that pool uh, is 26.7 feet from the uh, flag wetlands. Um, they want to put in a new pool uh, and abandon that, uh, that existing pool. Uh, this one's going to be installed closer to the wetlands at about 22 and a half feet. Um, and I think, um, you yeah, know, it's just 22 and a half feet from the wetlands. It's going to be a lot of disruption with uh, abandoning the existing pool and putting in a new pool. They, they seem to not want to put it in the same location. So I think the applicant will be at the next meeting to explain uh, in detail, you know, why they're, why they're doing that. Okay. Um, so I think, um, you know, again, what we have <clears throat> the, our um, new applications for receipt, we can choose to go on a site walk. Um, I believe we were all there for the previous site walk. Is that right for this property? Yeah. So we walked I'm, in. I'm not sure whether I was there. Oh, okay. No. Bob was okay. not there. Okay. Um, well, we could do a site walk. Um, it's also, it's right on the road. I think you can drive by. Um, I don't think I need a site walk. Uh, John, what do you think? No, it's, 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 the plan is really pretty good. If you look at that, you can really see where the existing pool is, where the new, uh, the new pool is going to go, and what they've already done. You know, they've got a lot of, they've, they've had uh, uh, wetlands permission to do all the work that they've done up to this date. So, okay. Uh, all right. So that application is received because it's automatically received. Um, so our next. Application is 22 14, 27 Scenic Road. Um, right. John Delora, I think you just said that. So they want to put a shed up, but it sounds like in looking at the application, they're not going to be able to, they're going to have to go to the health department for this. Or well, I did. I, I actually consulted with the health uh, director this afternoon on this project because of the, sanis the sanitary system is a new uh, uh, professional engineer design system. And they brought in um a type of soil you know to you know for this system and uh we gave them sort of an optional place to put the the shed which they didn't uh they didn't prefer that so they did submit an application with the shed literally i don't know maybe uh, i think it was like 18 feet you know from the wetlands in this uh, uh material that was required for the sanitary system and the health director told me this afternoon that based on the location of the shed, he would not be able to approve uh, that location. So I think, okay. I, I think I'll go back to the applicants you know, tomorrow, let them know this and see if we can come up with a, another location and then uh, you know, uh, hear it maybe next, uh, next month. Okay. Do we have to receive it again, or do we receive no, Well, you can receive it now and, and with, with me just you know, getting new information. Uh, that would that would get them uh, an approval with the health department because they they're not going to get it where, where they have it now. Okay, so they can modify what what is yeah. being received tonight. Yeah. All right. Okay, and then our final um, new application is twenty two dash fifteen seventeen Carmel Court. Yeah. Um, this is to remove trees and install an in-ground pool within the wetland review area. Yeah, I, I would recommend this as a site walk, I think. 
Okay. Yeah. You know, the, the, the pool edge is just 40 feet from the wetlands and there's no contours on the, on the uh, site plan. Uh, that doesn't include the coping. It doesn't include any terrace. You can't really see where the trees are going to be uh, removed. So I think it might be it might be advantageous for the agency to take a walk on, on that property, and uh, I can attend that walk with you. Do you know how they chose the location of that pool? Because it seemed like it's kind of out in the middle of the. Yeah, I, 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 unless it's to avoid the sanitary system, which also may be back there. Uh, but they didn't do an overlay. So, uh, you know, there's a couple of things. I think that's probably uh, what we can determine at a site walk too with uh, the applicant there. Okay. Um, all right. Well, uh, can, so do we have to vote on site walks? Or can, or yeah. can you just, okay. Except yeah. we've, we've lost Joe. <laughs> Yeah, we can just schedule a site walk. Okay. You know, and we'll, I'll take a poll, you know, uh, tomorrow or the next day to see how many we can get to be at the same place at the same time. And then okay. you know, we can do it that way. Okay. Oh, good. Here comes Joe again. Disappeared into our <laughs> webinar. Okay. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. We can hear you. We can't see you now. We can't see you, but All we right. can hear you. All right, I changed. So I changed my uh, my devices, and I left my agenda at work. But this one had at least four notes of getting a new survey topography. The basin outline is what they showed on the plan. They didn't show the outer patio and disturbance area. This one screams A two survey. And I don't think it should be received incomplete. There is, a, there is a survey associated with this application. I believe but that. But it didn't have like topography and it didn't show the full expanse of the pool area. So they could modify it. <clears throat> sure. The, the applicant, yeah. Yeah. yes. And, and that's that can be discussions that staff have with the applicant ahead of the next meeting of some of some of these outstanding items that should be yeah. included. Yeah. And um, def definitely ENS to the hilt. Okay. But it, yeah. it so I think then Joe, you would agree that a site walk is is warranted probably for this. Yeah, I think we did a site walk for the Texas Road pool, correct? Yeah, we did a site walk for that. Okay, um, this one's in the same boat. Yeah, so we should. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we'll. So, John, to Laura, you're, you'll send out dates and times, and we'll we'll check that out. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, all right. So, under our system, these are all, all already received, and we have scheduled one site walk. One is going to be modified, and then we'll hear the next one, the Texas Road, at the next um, meeting in April. So um, we have 15 minutes until our public hearing opens. Can we skip to the minutes, you think? Good idea. Yeah, let's skip to the minutes and um, get those out of the way. Let's be efficient. So we have, um, well, we can start with the oldest. We have our meeting minutes from February 7th, 2022. Did anybody have um, comments, mm -hmm. questions, thing? Um, I will admit I printed them, but I didn't have time today to read them. Okay. <laughs> so, I, so those minutes would reflect the last meeting, not the site walk. Okay. Right. Right, right. We do have site so, walk meetings too. But this is this so these minutes um we had we had a fair number. We had um let's see, we talked about Lover's Lane. Um we talked about opening hill subdivision. Um we talked about River's okay, Edge farm this road that farm um right, River's Edge. Uh except they had um 
if they'd taken that off. Um, and then we received minutes. Yeah, I think, I, think I, I would recommend we punt both sets to next month because <laughs> I'd like to read them first. That's okay. just me though. That's fine. So I, I, I assume that means you want to table them? Yes. Okay. Like to table them? okay. I'm still in football mode. I like to punt. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I motion, well, I don't think I have to motion, but I recommend tabling or continuing to next month. Yeah, we can table them and, and do them next month. Yeah. Um, okay, well. The only comment I had on the, on the sidewalk <laughs> meeting, um, uh, uh, one little thing, there's a typo in the title of the meeting for the sidewalk spelled walk walk is spelled incorrectly i just noticed that but the bigger thing is it reminded me that it reminded me that we requested paper copies of of um yeah full scale full scale, full scale. plans have those come in yet john or aaron uh, yes there were revision there were full set paper drawings that came in um that actually included revisions on them um that staff had met with the applicant and their engineer. Um, and so a revised set of drawings was sent to us on Friday afternoon um, that John and I uh, will go through likely tomorrow. Um, and if if those are answered our, our question, the applicant will print them. Um, so they should be available um, hopefully for Wednesday. Um, for physical copies, okay. Because um, our next meeting, our special meeting, when when is it? It's Thursday. Thursday. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, so we'll we'll do our best to get those to you. Uh, we okay. we didn't anticipate revisions in those copies. Um. Okay. So let's look through what else. Um. Well, that'll be next month. Oh, by the way, congratulations, Kia, on being our chair, excellent chair for the next year. <laughs> I did want to ask Lee why he thought we were excellent. Oh, no, I think the meetings have been going, going very well. I think uh, everybody's been doing a really good job. Yep. During these dark times, Kia Loha has been our, a great leader. Yes, yes. Well, I think, I, I think we all uh, are doing well in these challenging times which reminds me well we may be having so we have so we have like so we may as well go we've got 11 minutes so um part of our agenda is also remarks by the chairman and in the wetland officer and um i will just say so clearly we're down on numbers and it may be that we have a new member joining us so that will be exciting mm -hmm. Nice. Um, maybe even Thursday. Yeah. Oh, and two, so maybe yeah. two new members. Um, oh, which would be that would take the heat off us to always be here. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> so uh, is it is it three of us right now, or do we have a fourth? No, well, we're yeah. four now tonight, and then we have Bob. Right. And then okay. That's right. I saw John. Yes, we have okay. five, but we're, I think four is our quorum. So we're, yep. you know, um, I, only one of us gets to be absent for me. <laughs> uh, um, so, Bob has taxes normally in April, so he's normally not available in April. Yeah, so he, he, he's claimed the absence slot. Um, but having two more um, members would be great. Yeah. Um, so that'd be exciting. So those are my remarks, since we're doing remarks. John, did you have any inland wetland park remarks? No, not, not, not really. I wasn't prepared to give a remark. I <laughs> thought it was going to be at the end. It's going to be good night. <laughs> it was gonna, I didn't want to keep anybody up any later than I had to. So. Okay. Well, if, if, if anything occurs to you, you can let us know. Um, yeah, is everybody here going to be able to be there on Thursday night? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what's the agenda for Thursday? 
we it, we've sent yeah we we have sent that out um, and we can email you. Is it the site uh, lock ones? No, because they're all gone. It, it's the other items that were on your. Okay, I'll look for it. Uh, on the agenda as as regular meeting items. Okay. Um, um, Madam Chair, I guess you know we we have about eight minutes until the public hearing is scheduled to start. So you you could do a, a brief recess if you'd like and allow everyone to <laughs> <laughs> to gear up, go get your coffee, grab, go grab get your coffee, <laughs> or or take a quick break, and then we can we can reconvene at seven thirty. Yeah, that's a great idea. All right, that so works. see you guys in eight minutes. All right, mm -hmm. I'm gonna leave my camera on. It just it's just easier. Are we all back? All we, as in, in the wetlands agency? Is Joe there? I think you're still waiting for Joe. Yeah. There you are. Okay. Um, so we have our um, continuing our public hearing. Does someone want to make a motion that we reopen this? I move we open the open public hearing. I don't know uh, on thirty five Cottage Road. I don't know what the application number is. So I forgot. It's a uh, 21-31. 21-31. Okay. I will second that. All right. Um, all in favor, <laughs> opening up the public hearing. Okay. Hi. So um, what I'd like to do to start off with is to um, kind of outline where we're at and what we should be doing tonight. So, um, this is, I believe, our third public hearing. Um, we started our, the first hearing opened on December 6. We had the applicant present, the intervener filed their application to intervene. Um, we had some discussion. Um, we did continue that first hearing to January 10th. We reopened, the intervener had a chance to discuss um, the, um, the topics they were concerned about. Um, we also had a significant number of comments from the public on that date. Um, the agency asked questions and then the applicant requested continuing the hearing in order to address everyone's concern. Um, and so the hearing was continued to February 2nd, um, but then continued again until tonight. So that's where we are. We've had um, the applicant present, we've had the intervener comment, and then we've had questions and we've had the um, applicant um, ask questions as well. And we've heard from the public. So for tonight, um, what we have in the record is we have um, responses from the applicant to the intervener's concerns. Um, and so we'll hear from the applicant tonight on how they've responded to the intervener. All right. Madam Chair, if I may just ask um, if applicants and I'll take a quick look and see if there's someone as an attendee who I may have missed. I don't see anyone else with their hands raised to be a panelist, but I just wanted to make sure I have you all um, where you need to be. Aaron, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I just wanted to uh, ask um, uh, Madam Chairman that uh, when the applicant uh, makes their presentation that uh, we have a chance to rebut. I have our experts uh, 
George Logan and uh, Steve Trinkus available. Um, okay, we can think about that, but you've already submitted your, they, I mean, they are responding to you. So you've already submitted Madam, your- This is kind of, uh, they put the cart before the horse in this particular application. Uh, as normally an application, the applicant makes the presentation and then the intervener gets to rebut the presentation. What happened here, uh, the, uh, the, the applicant provided some information, but not all. Now they provided new data and analysis, and we should be allowed to discuss that. Um, Madam Chair, this is Attorney excuse, Marjorie Shansky. Okay, excuse me, excuse me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna run this meeting, and so, the applicant is gonna have their chance to respond to your very detailed comments from last time. I believe they're, they're, the data that they submitted was in response to your, your application. I mean, your, the, the, all the comments that your experts submitted. So we're gonna hear from the applicant. We can revisit hearing from the intervener, but this, this is, you know, everyone has had their chance. The applicant is now responding to what you've had. And tonight is our last public hearing. We've reached the statutory limits of holding this open. Um, and so we can, I'd like to start with the applicant. And I would like, we've heard from everyone um, multiple times. And so what we're gonna hear is the applicant can respond to your concerns and then we can see you know, if you need to respond, but, but, but you, you know, what they submitted was a response mm. to your comments. Also, also Kia, this is not a court. So obviously right. these, these, everyone can argue till the cows come home, but we're here to take in all the testimony. We're not here to argue. And um, so there should be limitations on the intervener's response, because obviously their role is to help protect the environment, ask questions. They brought in their experts. Uh, Marjorie's team is going to respond. I don't think the um, intervener's experts are going to really enlighten us tonight, because they did give pretty detailed information uh, two months ago, but I think we should limit the um, last go around tonight. If they want to go to court, that's not for tonight. Oh, okay. <laughs> We're just going to work on wetland issues. We're just going to, this, that's, and, and it isn't a court. We are just an agency reviewing a wetland application. So we will start with the applicant responding, hopefully in a succinct as much way as we can. And then um, we will see where we're at. So please, Attorney Shansky. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the agency. I'd like first to respond to Ms. Mannix's question. Dr. Michael Clemens is finishing up chairing his planning commission meeting up in Salisbury. So please let him in when he arrives. Thank you. Uh, I am attorney Marjorie Shansky. I represent 35 Cottage LLC in this application to conduct regulated activities at 35 Cottage Road in Madison. Madam Chair, our responses that were filed prior to, you know, two weeks ago and a few days after that are responsive to the interveners, but also responsive to the agency members' questions and to comments that have been made by the public. So we consider our response to be global and comprehensive. With me tonight are Mike Picard and Rich Gentile, principals of the owner as well as Michael Ott, professional engineer from Summer Hill, civil engineers and land surveyors in Madison, Mark Lancor, professional engineer from Dymar Engineers and Land Surveyors, Eric Davison, wildlife biologist, professional soil scientist and professional wetland scientist from Davison Environmental, Dr. Michael Clemens, conservation biologist and herpetologist, and Abigail Adams, landscape architect from A2 Land Consulting. Our program this evening will include testimony from each of the development team members. 
each of whom has submitted a letter report or other materials responsive to questions raised by the agency, by the interveners, and by the public. We are here discussing a permit to conduct regulated activity in connection with the development of multifamily housing under the provisions of Section 830G of the Connecticut General Statutes. There are no direct wetland impacts proposed. The proposed activity is in the regulated upland or elsewhere on the parcel. Prior to tonight, I have submitted two letters into the record, which I hope the agency members have taken time to read. The first dated December 6, 2021, and the second is dated February 22, 2022. In my first letter, I discussed the Inland Wetland Agency jurisdiction, a topic that's always worth reviewing, particularly in a case like this, where the proposed activity is in the upland review area, not in the wetland itself. And in my recent letter, the February letter, I provided a non-exhaustive analysis using the evaluation criteria under 22A41A of the Wetlands Act and section 10.2 of your regulations and marshaled how the evidence adduced at this hearing, including tonight, establishes the applicant's eligibility for the permit it seeks under the regulations. In December, the agency did receive a petition to intervene in these proceedings. And technically, Madam Chair, none of the claims of the interveners in their petition satisfy the requirements of Connecticut General Statute Section 22A19. They certainly do not provide any proof that establishes the reasonable likelihood of unreasonable pollution within the agency's jurisdiction as a result of the proposed activity, which is their burden under the environmental intervention. The claims that the application lacks data or lacked data and analysis are not claims or proof of unreasonable pollution. The claims included unsubstantiated conclusions of adverse impact. None of the claims were supported by any evidence. Mr. Logan's letter dated December 6th appended to the petition is a series of claims labeled findings, also not supported by any evidence. There is no specificity. In, as I discussed in my February 22nd letter, in order to qualify as substantial evidence, evidence must come from an expert. It must be specific. It must quantify the evidence and there must be an explanation of the sequence of events that will create the impact. The agency has not received any evidence from the interveners or their experts that satisfy the requirements of substantial evidence. And this deficit also applies to claims advanced by plaintiffs, uh, by petitioners council who has not disclosed any expertise that supports opinions on topics deemed technical in the wetlands context. And I would also mention that council admitted a document into the record labeled affidavit, which is not an affidavit, but a self-serving hearsay document, not attested to before an officer, which is a requirement of an affidavit, and not even signed by council. It has his juris number on it, something we do in a court pleading, but not appropriate to these pleadings, uh, to these proceedings. The agency should treat this document accordingly. At 614 and at 641 this evening, we received additional correspondence from the interveners, from Mr. Trinkus and from Mr. Logan. We find the timing of that submission objectionable, but we'll do our best to deal with what is contained in that reporting still just objecting to the record that we have made, but not providing substantial evidence of any adverse impact. And Madam Chair, we have reviewed all of the letters from members of the public and the international petition that has been received by this commission. 
and those writings, and I respect the concerns of the residents in Madison, but vague general words such as concern or further or potential or higher, these are not words of evidence. Without specific quantification and sequence, they are not substantial evidence. They are not a basis on which this commission can make a negative determination. The Wetlands Commission may not deny a regulated activity permit application unless it has received substantial evidence that the proposed construction will have an actual adverse impact on a function of a wetland or watercourse. That evidence has not been received by this commission. There has only been speculation. Now, Madam Chair, I will turn this over at this point to the experts, but following their presentations and perhaps questions from the commission, I do have additional uh, information that I would like to share with the commission before you go off to the next phase of this hearing. But I thank you at this time and look forward to speaking with you shortly. And we'll start with Mr. Ott, followed by Mr. Lancor, Mr. Davison, and Dr. Clemens. Thank you. Is Mike here? We lost Mike, it looks like, to me. In which event, we'll go to Mr. Lancor, but I wonder what happened to Mr. Ott. Perhaps I'll try calling him. All right, Mr. Lancor, I guess you're up. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm sorry to see Mike is not with us right yet, but I'm sure he'll join us shortly. Uh, for members of the commission and Madam Chair and members of the public, my name's Mark Lankor. I'm the principal engineer with DIMAR, uh, located at 800 Main Street South in Southbury, Connecticut. And I'm here basically to respond to uh, Mr. Trinkus's letter, uh, specifically to the uh, comments that he made regarding the septic system and impacts on the water quality in the pond. That letter was uh, dated January 30th, 2022. And more specifically, uh, just to give you a little bit of background about myself, I have been uh, a registered professional engineer in the state of Connecticut since 1982. I've been practicing wastewater management um, on various levels. Uh, since 1977, um, anywhere from large treatment plants, 50 to 100 million gallons a day, uh, to small systems, and specifically uh, working with the Connecticut DEP since 1982. So I think I'm quite familiar with their uh, standards and their protocols, how it works, and as well as the science behind wastewater management which I think is extremely important, not just from a, uh, from a desktop, but also from a practical standpoint of what actually happens in the field and then what the results are from going from design to commissioning and to actual operations, which we do a lot with plant operators and understand what we call the kinetics of wastewater management. Uh, so uh, from that aspect, uh, I've also um, developed systems for the DEP, large scale disposal systems up to 75,000 gallons a day on properties. So that's pretty large in terms of you think about impacts and these are conventional systems without any treatment as well as working on treatment for specialized plants uh, for various commercial school properties and residential properties throughout the state of Connecticut and in the state of New York. Uh, I've also presented to the Connecticut DEP and the Department of Public Health on the components of how to justify capacity using Connecticut DEP criteria. Uh, specifically, uh, did a, a large uh, at a conference a few years ago. Was asked to do that and uh, was happy to do so, and uh, was well received by both the uh, Department of Health, the public, and other professionals in the industry. So I'm gonna just get right to it in terms of addressing Mr. Trinkus's comments. 
And you've received a letter from us dated February 24th, 2022, that was assigned that had various attachments to it. Uh, attachment A, B, and C, uh, which was part of my letter. And what I would really like to start with is this notion of trying to trying to cross what I call cross paths between different jurisdictions. As we well know that this application already has had an approval from the Connecticut Department of Health up in Hartford, uh, specifically to the wastewater system. And I think it needs to go hand in hand with the fact that the Connecticut Department of Health it looks out for the public health and welfare. And that's not just, that's every aspect of it. Uh, when the public health was set up with their standards, it was weighed to basically uh, to handle smaller systems uh, for single properties, anything today, anything under 7,500 gallons a day is regulated by the Department of Health. And so when you look at that, and this particular project has a design flow of 2,800 gallons per day by the Department of Health standards. And I must preface that because uh, the Department of Health standards are much different than the Connecticut DEP standards. So when we look at evaluating this, and what I'm gonna preface it is that we evaluated the uh, impacts based on using Connecticut DEP standards. We did not, tried to mix the two. It's inappropriate to try to mix the two standards. And I've been working with the DEP for so many years. I know exactly what I'm allowed to do and what is permitted and I can do in terms of the science. So I say this, that as much as we're going to look at the uh, Connecticut DEP standards and how applying those standards to this particular property, I have to caution this agency and any agency that tries to mix the blending of two different standards because it is something that sends the wrong message, it sends the wrong message to the Connecticut DPH, circumventing their authority, which they have already have the public health in mind, and the jurisdictional thresholds that go with it uh, actually can be inconsistent with the state statutes. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it becomes almost harmful to property owners when you are starting to um, apply different standards to different properties that it's not appropriate to do that. But nonetheless, we did do that. We did look at those standards, but I just wanted to make it clear that in practice, it's inconsistent with the state statutes. Okay, so an implying different set of standards based on Connecticut DEP, again, it can have a profound negative impact on setting precedents. That most residential properties, especially along the, uh, the coast where we have uh, deeper sands and gravels, we have coarser materials, uh, that these standards could not, could not be satisfied by most residential households, including your own, um, because the standards are so, uh, so restrictive and they're very scientific that the average homeowner's property couldn't meet that standard. So when you really look at it, most folks here, if you had to apply that standard, you probably wouldn't be able to live in the house that you're living in because you couldn't be able to meet the standard and therefore uh, it becomes a very big issue a long way. So, and it's also considerably costly to meet that standard. Um, as much as I know you're not looking at economics and that's not part of your forte, you're looking at the water quality and the impacts of wetlands and water courses. Uh, I just need to make it note that uh, to applying any of those standards, it's extremely costly. And it's the reasons why there is a separation between DPH, Connecticut Department of Health and Connecticut DEP because DEP looks at much, what I say, much larger scale systems that have to have a closer scrutiny of a scientific end of evaluating their impacts. And why is because two basic areas, nitrate nitrogen, I mean, which is a subject matter that everybody has been talking about here under this application. 
and bacteria travel time are the two most difficult components for uh, to comply with those standards. And so those thresholds, when you apply them to a smaller property or smaller flows, especially if it was residential, again, you probably would not be able to meet that standard without getting into some sort of specialized treatment, which then that is not the purview and the Connecticut DPH doesn't look at it under that circumstance. Hydraulics is always a area that is considered with DEP in terms of how the movement of water, how the discharge actually um, moves through the aquifer. And that's what you have here. You have an aquifer and the separation distance that's required between a septic system and the bottom of that system and the groundwater is of paramount importance to the DEP. And that standard is actually increased above the kinetic DPH. Uh, again, the burden of applying this to the general public in any residential lot um, would be very difficult. And I just, again, would like to emphasize that. Uh, Connecticut DEP basically evaluates impacts in a considered zone of influence. That zone of influence is the area in which the discharge will co-mingle with the groundwater and eventually discharges like every all groundwater discharges eventually atmospherically to a wetland or a water course or a river or stream or a pond. So they look at the zone of influence in terms of how those impacts are evaluated. So with Mr. Trinkus, Mr. Trinkus, uh, who I've known a long time, I respect him. I respect him as an engineer, but I will say this, there are certain things that you're good at and certain things that you are not. And I will say that, uh, you know, Steve's got, you know, his area of expertise is as an engineer is it really the stormwater management and that sort of thing. But when it comes down to uh, these kinds of systems and this evaluation and in terms of how those impacts and what are the standards and, and how does the DEP look at things, um, I would say that that's not Steve's strongest point. And therefore, when he evaluated this particular site, he took uh, extreme liberties. Extreme liberties as a profession I would never do because the fact is it comes down to facts. We are engineers and as engineers, we are basing our uh, opinions based on information and data. And what Mr. Trinkus did in his first letter is made a bunch of assumptions that basically had no scientific backing. So therefore falsely uh, brought information to the public that was not uh, supported by any known fact. Uh, it could have been as simple as in his letter, could have said, we would suggest that you evaluate the Connecticut DEP standards and leave it at that. But to throw, and I say information at the commission that had no scientific backing was completely inappropriate. And, it dis and it's, it's not what I consider the standard of professional care that engineers have to provide to commissions like yourself and the public. So with that, areas that I did agree with Mr. Trinkus on was that uh, his concentration for residential TKM, which is uh, the influent at 60 milligrams per liter is a purely acceptable number. And that the 40% reduction in nitrogen um, is an acceptable number, although he noted it as, as it comes from one element from the disposal system. It's actually 20% in the tank and 20% in the disposal system. And that's kind of, that is the standard that the DEP will look at unless you have other scientific information that would support something differently. So all the other areas that Mr. Trinkus had provided are purely or inaccurate assumptions and should have left it at just asking for the evaluation and it would have been more appropriate to do it that way. So in the truth of evaluating any uh, system is actually finding out the physical characteristics and appropriately uh, in the short amount of time, and I will say it was in a short amount of time, we were able to get a lot of things done. Uh, as for many here in the commission, it is very difficult to get a, uh, a driller at this point 
Um, when I was brought into the uh, into this project, there was a limited amount of time, and it just happened to be that I have some great working relationships with a few folks that were able to juggle and move their uh, their drilling operations around, including the uh, geotechnical consultant that I work with, which is down to earth and. And uh, they are a geotechnical consultant as well as an environmental consultant. So they were able to juggle and be able to get us the information that we needed in a very, very short period of time. At this point, it is uh, from a drillers, it's like four or five months out for us to get drillers. So, so in evaluating those characteristics, we look to drill, determine where the groundwater level was, uh, determine and get soils, get permeabilities of soils, which are is, is, is trans, is the hydraulic conductivity of the soils, tells us basically how much the soils can pass, and then get water characteristics. Uh, those water characteristics we got in all the wells that we drilled, in which we drilled five. Uh, we did one up by the upper end of the uh, septic system uh, towards our neighbor to the, to the uh, I believe that is to the uh, north. Um, and uh, one below the system, you know, the pond, and then uh, actually two low below the system, and then two on the uh, southern, southeastern uh, portion of the property on the southeast section of the pond. Those would be wells four and five. So one, two, and three are on the, on the uh, more on the north, northwestern side, and then the others are on the other side. Uh, and in that, we learned a lot. We learned that the uh, soils are, as um, my God has pointed out in his information with DPH is the, they're, uh, they're granular soils. Uh, um, and the uh, granulation of them is basically follows between fine to, uh, to medium sands with some gravel in it. Uh, <clears throat> and we took soil samples, took sieves uh, on each of those ponds. We took a number of them. And the reason we did those sieves is that actually there's a, uh, we can take those values on the sieves and be able to uh, identify uh, what the grain size is and the, uh, and we can plug it into a, uh, uh, what the standard that the DEP allows us to use is that in granular soils like this, uh, there are different methodologies to be able to determine permeability without having to do a hydraulic slug test. Uh, so we were able to do that and we learned a lot in doing so. We also measure the groundwater gradient on the day that we uh, drilled the wells. We did it uh, the following day and we did it uh, on that Monday following the time that we drilled the wells, which was on a uh, Thursday. Uh, with that, we were able to learn the hydraulic gradient of what that is. And as Mr. Uh, Trinkus purported that he took the liberty of suggesting that it was going to be following the uh, the contours of the uh, of the property was a completely inaccurate statement and shows that he lacks the experience in this field because in granular soils they never follow the height they never follow the topography and there's a reason for it is because it all comes down to energy it takes a lot less energy to push water through granular soils so uh, it typically never follows that gradient of, this, of, the, of the ground. And what we learned is that it was like eight tenths of a percent and it pretty steady, uh, which uh, at this time of year, based on all the years of my experience in the field, is that the high groundwater table typically occurs in the month of February. Uh, for those that have been under the circumstance that they think it always occurs, and it, it can occur in March, very rarely in April or May, but most times today it occurs in February because of the change of the way our climate has changed over the years and our thaw, it, typically it will happen. So we actually, it was a great timing for us to be able to drill now. And we were actually to, I believe that this would be the high, high groundwater table. And that's exactly what the DEP is looking for. And because it's sands, it's pretty, it's stable. This the groundwater gradient is not gonna alter all that much. In fact, uh, as the groundwater table lowers, it will probably even get lower. So um, with that, uh, we also 
like I said, looked at the hydraulic conductivity, which is the permeability of the soils. You need to use that in order to have its travel time. And uh, with those numbers, uh, we were able to determine that the, uh, the uh, travel time, the bacterial travel time, uh, which is in our, uh, was applied to our attachment, uh, find it here, it's attachment B, I believe, yes. Uh, it's, we, we provided the, uh, the information, um, it's an attachment B, where we uh, provided a computation uh, and we found that the estimated travel time was 15.7 feet uh, based on current, uh, the current uh, aquifer conditions at the time. Now, when we look at this, the, the state, and that's for 21 day travel time, that's what the standard is for DEP, 21 days. We're saying that 21 days, it'll take 15.7 feet to get 21 days travel time. The available length uh, to, the, um, to the wet basin, and this is what we looked at. We didn't take it to the pond, we took it to the wet basin because that's where ultimately that you would have a, uh, uh, you know, groundwater table that would show up in that wet basin is uh, 52 feet. So we have a substantial, substantial buffer here between that number of what uh, 52 versus 15.7. So we, there's no issue with the uh, travel time. It's not what Mr. Trinkus purported to, uh, that it was uh, numbers that were way beyond uh, the 21 day travel time. And so uh, again, he was basing his numbers on some hypothetical assumption that had no basis at all. Phosphorus, which was not really brought up, but it's again, it's another Connecticut DEP standard. We don't usually see phosphorus as an issue in most subsurface disposal systems. It happens to be because of the soils that we have in the state of Connecticut, even with uh, granular soils and with the DEP criteria, uh, we've got over five foot separation distance between the bottom of the system and the groundwater table, which gives us more than enough uh, zone for absorption, what we call absorption capacity for phosphorus removal. So that is not going to be an issue at all. Now, when it comes down to nitrogen, which is what uh, most of the uh, conversation has been, and I've seen through most of the uh, uh, reports, both from uh, Rima and from Steve Trinkus, is that uh, you know nitrogen is uh, is always a concern. It's always a concern in every every property uh, that we evaluate. And the threshold that DEP uses is 10 milligrams per liter, you know, at the point of concern. What Mr. Trinkus did in his evaluation is that he used the 2,700 gallons a day design flow. Well, it tells you where that, that is completely falsely stated. Um, again, in his most recent letter, you know, he purports that we're supposed to use the 2700 and not the 1500 that I use. And the 1500 that I use is completely appropriate because if you can't, you, you, it's, if you're going to play by the rules of DEP, you're going to end up using DEP standards. And DEP standards allow me on with, with regards to actual sewage flow from a, uh, you know, apartments or single family or multifamily projects, which we have done a number of them throughout the state. And over the years we've collected, I can't tell you how much information in terms of how much water use these facilities actually use. We probably have one of the largest databases in the state for actual water use data. Because, and the reason is because we monitor a lot of these, a lot of these properties over the years. So we did a study years ago with DEP, which they have accepted uh, as a baseline for uh, multifamily housing. And it is basically at um, 125 gallons per day design flow. And that's important distinction, it's a design flow. And what nitrogen is based on is average daily. Design flow is a maximum month. So you divide the, 
you divide the 125 by 1 1.5, that actually gets you down to 1,500 gallons a day. And if I was to apply this project to the state DEP, that's exactly what they would accept. And that's how you base your nitrogen levels on. And so using those figures, we, uh, in attachment B, have a pretty in-depth calculation in terms of how we can get to, how we got to less than 10 milligrams per liter in terms of nitrogen. And the highlights of that are, is that the DEP allows you to use every inch of water on your property. The zone of influence is one thing, that's the area in which you measure from, but you're allowed to use the zone of influence that contributes anything to the zone of influence. So whether it's roof water or I'm collecting it from another source and I'm applying it into a basin, as long as I can prove that that water can co-mingle, then I can, I can take credit for that water. And that's exactly what we did here. We took credit for rainfall that actually falls on in the zone of influence. We took credit for roof water, which we know that will collect and using the wet basin as a as a area for which this can commingle with. And only a proportion of it, 26% of it is all we use of the entire basin in terms of water that would contribute to it. And any overland flow that can contribute to that wet basin. As Mr. Trinkus has pointed out in terms of wetlands, and he actually provided you a slide on his last, on his last uh, letter, is that, yeah, the DEP allows us to use wetlands as a methodology for uh, nitrogen dilution, as well as nitrification. And especially in this case, when you have a wet basin, nitrification can be done within that wet basin. And the reason is, is because it's an anaerobic situation. What nitrification happens once you nitrify the ammonia and it travels to nitrates, travels to that basin, you are now with that basin, it's going to be in an anaerobic condition because it's underwater, partially underwater. And the certain the bacteria that are going to be within that uh, wet basin are going to be able to denitrify the uh, uh, nitrates itself, uh, which then goes atmospheric. Uh, the wet basin is an actual great attribute here. It, it provides that additional buffer. And that buffer in itself through its plants will be able to release nitrogen gas to the atmosphere. We had made a uh, notation that we took 50% credit for uh, the nitrogen removal capacity of that wet basin. And that is can be found in various documentations throughout various states, whether it's the state of Minnesota, New Jersey, or the US EPA, in which they give you a range of 40 to 60% that would be considered a conservative approach to what those basins can do. And so that goes again to the plant material and then providing the environment that would allow for that denitrification process. It's completely acceptable to the DEP to use that kind of methodology in nitrogen removal. So it's it's with 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 my opinion that and, and there's a lot in the the documentation is very detailed, uh, I, I, more detail far than the interveners have provided. The interveners have not basically provided you with any scientific uh, information that is supported by a calculation, uh, which we have provided the commission with. Um, so. I understand that you know it's a complicated process. Nitrogen is not a very easy subject for many. It's a bit one of the more complicated uh, cycles um, in terms of its chemistry and biology and how it works, especially with ponds. Uh, it changes seasonally as it is affected by pH, it's affected by temperature, rainfall, aquatic plants, the type of plants, lawn fertilization, fish and various invertebrate contributions. So it, again, it's, it's, and you can't measure it all up in one day. And, and to Mr. To Logan's point in Rima's most recent letter, yes, it changes seasonally. That's why this Connecticut DEP looks at it on an average daily basis because 
you cannot get out and actually you you'd end up you know provide to provide information every uh, season on an application it was it's completely uh, completely uh, out of order and uh, applicants wouldn't be able to they'd be studying these areas forever there's plenty of scientific information that's out there on the uh, with with the papers that will tell you um, you know uh, how these uh, systems work and how nitrification can work and why the DEP sets their self up as a very conservative standard. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, with this, I, 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 I commend our applicant, uh, my client, for actually introducing this wet basin because in the end of the day, this green resource uh, will be highly effective in removing nitrogen, in particular in the form of nitrates, as well as other pollutants. Uh, Mr. Logan had made a comment in his last, uh, uh, last letter that how does one know where the nitrogen level is going to be, you know, in the water in terms of how groundwater gets to that basin. It's well documented that nit nitrate nitrogen actually accumulates mainly in the upper two feet of any water resource and groundwater. Uh, it's well documented by published papers because this has been studied heavily. The only time you get a situation where it may end up going deeper is when you have an irrigation well or a well where you have potential mixing, where you're drawing from an influence outside of a zone of influence of the well in which you are actually mixing groundwater's at different level. But here, we're talking that most of that, all that uh, heavy, the higher concentration of nitrate nitrogen occurs in the upper two feet, of which we are going to be intercepting through our wet basin, because uh, in that wet basin area, we've actually got deeper section up to three feet of more organic material, all good, what I call it, it's all good stuff. That's the kind of stuff I like to see when it comes to actually creating a wet basin. So we've got the we've got the we've got the uh, the characteristics to allow this wet basin to succeed and do exactly what I'm hope I, I know it will do and that's where it will remove the nitrogen. So I would say, in my professional opinion, uh, the proposed on-site sewage disposal system will not result in an adverse impact to wetlands or water courses. Satisfies the factors of consideration provided by Section 22A-41 of the Connecticut General Statutes and satisfies the criteria provided by the commission's regulations. The housing proposal is not reasonably likely to result in an unreasonable pollution, impairment, or destruction of the public trust in the air, water, or other natural resources in the state of Connecticut. I thank the commission and um, I'll be happy to answer any questions when it's appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask moving forward that we keep our comments respectful and civil and keep it to our wetlands. Um, I don't think we need to do character assassinations on other people on this call. So um, I appreciate all the information you gave, but I, I think it will, this will go much smoother if we can all just be civil tonight. I assume Mr. Ott is next. You, yes, yes, Madam Chairman, if you can hear me, I hope. Yep. Um, so I, I apologize. I, I lost my internet connection. I'm logged back in in a, not through the Zoom app. I'm not quite sure how I'm logged back in, but um, I guess I have audio, but I don't have video. So hopefully I won't lose the connection. Um, I'll try to do this as, as succinctly as I can, as quickly as I can. Um, um, can the, can the agency still hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, um, so just for the record, I'm, I'm Michael Ott. I'm a licensed professional engineer and land surveyor with Summer Hill Civil Engineers and Land Surveyors. And our office is on Wall Street in Madison. Um, I, um, <clears throat> excuse me, submitted a response letter to the review letter prepared by Trinkus Engineering um, LLC, um, I, I, 
I revised that letter on February 25th, 2022. And I'm, I'm hopeful that the commission has seen that letter and had a chance to read it. Um, so I'm going to, um, th this letter, as you, as noted in the very beginning, uh, addresses all of the comments in the Trinkus Engineering LLC review dated January 30th of this year, um, with the exception of the, the three comments uh, regarding the, uh, the subsurface sewage disposal system, which um, Mark Lancor from Dimar has covered. So I'm going to go through this as, as quickly as I can. Um, did, did, did the commission, did the agency get a chance to read this letter? Yes. Well, Hopefully. I did. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, I missed it, Mike, so I apologize. I thought I went through everything, but so you're going to have to summarize it for me. Oh, that's okay. I will, um, again, I'll try to be quick. Um, I realize it's 20 after eight already. Um, so I'll, I'll try to go through this quickly. Um, uh, some of these I'll spend a uh, not a lot of time on, and some of them I'll spend a little bit more time on. So just to just to get started, uh, the first review comment um, indicates that the construction sequence in the erosion control notes in our drawing set uh, is is generic and not specific to the project. Um, I, it's my this is the same. Um, general um, sequence of site work construction activities that we always use. Um, it's been used for for many years for many projects. Um, uh, projects I have worked on for municipalities, for state states plural um, beyond Connecticut, and for federal um, agencies also. And I, and I believe it is in fact specific to this project. Um, the second comment indicates that the project narrative um, in the erosion control notes is not uh, in compliance with the um, Connecticut guidelines for soil erosion and sediment control. Uh, you will, I, I'd encourage the commission to take a look at that document, take a look at the chapter and the part in the section that I referenced and you will see that the narrative is in fact in compliance. And again, it's the same narrative that's been used um, uh, many times for many years and no reviewing agency has ever uh, um, had any issues with it. The third comment is uh, was simply a typo. Um, on, on my set of drawings, I had indicated that erosion control measure details for erosion controls were shown on sheet C 3.9, they were actually shown on C 3.8. They were clearly in the drawing set, it was simply a typo. Um, the, uh, the next comment is a, is a little more substantial. Um, the, the review letter indicates that our sediment control barrier, barrier is shown right outside the inland wetland boundary. And if there's a breach of that barrier or a failure, uh, there'll be discharge of sediment into the wetland and the pond, actually, specifically. So as, as I described in the, in the letter, in the response, um, the sediment control barrier is purposefully, by necessity, shown along the high water mark of the pond. Um, this is, this is the, the only way to do this work whenever you... <clears throat> construct a stormwater wetland, a constructed stormwater wetland adjacent to a natural wetland or, or a water body, a, a, a pond or a lake, um, you by necessity have to make the proper connection to the, the natural resource, the, the wetland, the natural wetland or water body. Um, I note you'll you'll note that I indicated in, in this response that the the this work, if you think about this, to construct the wetland, you have to excavate down outside of the limits of the pond some six inches to two feet, where the ground is higher in elevation, the ground surface is higher in elevation than the pond. 
you have to excavate down to elevation 3.5. When you once you complete that, you will have, if you think about it, you will have an area 18 inches lower than the high water elevation of the pond, which which is the water course boundary, as as delineated by Rich Snarsky. So after that is done, the berm would be formed with a small machine and by hand. And that if, if there was to be a rain event, water and sediment would first enter the, the newly excavated area that's been created. Um, it's my opinion that this is the only way to do this. Um, it's very commonly done. I'll give you one example. I worked on a project at Lake Kamenasset once where we created wetlands around the water, the edge of the water supply reservoir. And this is exactly um, how we did it. There's really no other way to do it, if you think about it. Um, um, all sediment barriers are subject to failure. Um, you, in, in this particular instance, you cannot have a double barrier. We have a state hay bale. Uh, we have a, I'm sorry, we have a geotextile silt fence backed by a staked hay bale barrier. The staked hay bale barrier is not there necessarily to prevent sediment, although it will to some degree. It is there to support the geotextile silt fence as surface water flow and sediment laden water might come up against the barrier. That's the purpose of the hay bale barrier. Um, I'd like, I, I should have said in the beginning, please stop me if you have any questions. Rather, rather than me just going through all this, I, 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 it, might, it might be better, might be more helpful for the commission if um, the agency, if you stopped me, if you'd like and ask questions. Um, uh, the next comment is that uh, uh, there are no stockpile, temporary stockpiles of material locations shown in the plan. And we, you know, we co I commented in the response that this is the, the size of this site is small. And the, 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 the short time periods of the various phases of construction in my opinion, on all sites like this, we should allow a contractor to decide where they're going to stockpile materials. We should not dictate where they will go because you, you will interfere with the contractor's operations. This is such a small site and not a lot of work. And the site conditions, the phases of the work change very quickly and materials are brought in and out of the site and site conditions change as the work progresses, a contractor should have the ability to temporarily stockpile materials where he or she chooses um, is the best location at various times during the progress of the work. It should also be noted that that the requirements for stockpiles are in fact on the drawings. If you, if you look at the drawings, the minimum standards for erosion and sediment controls and the contractor's responsibilities are identified on the drawings and stockpiling um, procedures to uh, control sedimentation from temporary material stockpiles are included in the non-structural measures, measures section of the erosion control notes in the drawing set. Um, the next comment, uh, talks about the hydrodynamic separator. So I, I think I, I think this is where I'm going to have to spend. Uh, actually, actually, I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back to the stormwater management system in general. Um, that's that's where I think we're going to have to spend quite a bit of time. So let me let me um, hold on that comment for a minute. The next comment is that there was no information on the proposed pipes for the drainage system that. The invert elevations, as you'll see in my response, the invert elevations of, are, of all storm sewers are included in the drawings, in the plan views, and in the details. There's notes on sheet 2.2, the CT 2.2, the general plan that indicates the storm sewer 
and the roof water drain pipe types, pipe joint types and sizes. So that information is in fact on the drawings. Um, um, there is a comment that, that um, there are no test pits in the area of the subsurface stormwater detention system. There, there are in fact, <clears throat> test, two test pits shown. The test pit logs are included in the stormwater management report. Um, there is a comment that says, it does not appear that the berm can be constructed. And this is the berm associated with the constructed stormwater wetland. Uh, there's a comment that it can't be constructed without filling, without placing fill within the inland wetland. And, and again, uh, it's my opinion that it, that it can, um, just as I described earlier, that it can in fact be constructed. Um, the, the, the intention of the berm, just as the detail shows, is for its downstream toe of slope to match the existing ground surface at the high water elevation of the pond, if that, if that makes sense to the agency. Um, any questions from the agency so far? Uh, no questions. Again, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to get through this quickly, so I apologize. Um, um, there, there is a comment that I, I, I don't actually think is an in, is a inland wetland and water courses issue, but I, I will address it because it was made. Um, there, there's a comment in the, in the review letter that indicates because the site is within a special flood hazard area zone and because we are um, placing fill and constructing a building within it, that we haven't provided an analysis regarding the loss of flood storage. Um, as, I, as I indicated in my response in the, in the administration of floodplain management regulations. When a municipality administers its floodplain management regulations, it is a standard of practice, certainly widely known on the shoreline, that when the site location is adjacent to a coastal high hazard area zone, and when the, when the flooding source is tidal waters that the the requirement to provide the flood storage back that you've lost uh, i should take i should rephrase there is no requirement to provide the flood storage that you've lost due to the placement of fill or construction that is not true as you move inland and get away from the shoreline where you're not adjacent to a coastal high hazard area zone and where the flooding source is not tidal waters. This is a standard of practice. And it's uh, just as I said in my letter, it's in accordance with guidance provided to municipalities to their floodplain managers by the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. Um, bear with me, please, one second. There's a comment that, that says that the the non-woven geotextile shown in our detail for the subsurface stormwater detention system, uh, it says that there's a non-woven geotextile shown in the detail. And the question is what happens when fine sediments clog the surface of the fabric? We, we responded that a non-woven geotextile for separation and subsurface drainage applications is in fact called out in the detail. It's the proper geotextile type to use. And in fact, it's the type of geotextile recommended to be used by the manufacturer of the chambers that we're using in the storage reservoir for the detention system. The stormwater, I will get into this later, but the stormwater detention system is just that. It is not it was not designed and it's not intended to provide an infiltration function. That's very clearly stated in the stormwater management report. Um, uh, there is a comment that 
um, the, the combination of geotextile silt fence and staked straw bales um, uh, is an ineffective erosion control barrier. And if the fence fails, the hay bales will not stop sediment laden runoff from reaching the wetland or the pond. The, the combination of geotextile silt fence backed by state straw bales is a commonly used combination sediment control barrier. The details are in the current version of the Connecticut guidelines for soil erosion and sediment control. Um, and it's our opinion that it's an appropriate barrier for this particular location and these conditions. And as I said earlier, the straw bales are not intended to be the, the defender, the full defender of preventing sediment laden water from entering the resource, the geotextile silt fence is. The, the bales are there to back up the silt fence and, and, and help prevent it from being knocked over. The next comment, there's a detail for a straw wattle on the sheet and a straw wattle cannot be found on the site plan. Um, I, we, we answered saying that we, we believe that um, straw, straw wattles are a common barrier type and that the contractor may choose to use that barrier. And that's why we provided the detail. We don't have to show every location where every erosion control measure will be used. We provided in, 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 in plain, plain language, common sense reason why we provided a straw waddle detail on our plans. Straw bales are very expensive right now. All contractors voice concerns about the cost of straw bales. Sometimes straw wattles, which are much less expensive, can be used in certain applications. That's why we thought a straw wattle is a likely erosion control measure that a contractor might want to use. And we simply included the detail on the drawings. The commission should know, I think the commission knows this, that the Connecticut soil erosion and sediment control guidelines are full of all kinds of details for different erosion control measures. No set of construction drawings or permitting drawings shows all those details. The, the, however, there are notes on the drawings that indicate that the, it's the contractor's responsibility to be familiar with that document, the Connecticut um, Guidelines for Soil Erosion and Sediment Control, and use not only what's on the drawings, but the appropriate erosion control measures uh, for a particular site, for a particular um, phase of construction as the work progresses. Um, there, um, I, may, I may be down to the stormwater management report. Um, and I, I think I am. So any, any questions at this point from the agency? Okay, so the stormwater management system, I think I'm not going to be able to share my screen, but I wonder if if um, Erin, the town planner, um, might be able to share her screen and show the general plan sheet of um, of the drawing set. If that if that's okay, Erin, um, and I, I think that'll help the commission. I, I I think I should explain the stormwater management system again. I know I explained it early on. Um, but I will, I will do my best with Aaron's help to, uh, to explain it. Can, could you zoom in on the, on the parking area, Aaron? So Any I, more? I, uh, no, that's good actually. So I don't know what all those squares are. That's a PDF thing. All those little rectangles around text. Um, that's actually not on our drawings, but I think it's okay. Though. I think we can we can see what, what we need to see. So um, I'll, I'll try to explain this succinctly. So the storm stormwater runoff from the vast majority of the parking area, the driveways, 
the sidewalk and the sidewalks in front of the building and the in the area, even the lawn area in front of the building. Um, stormwater runoff from that that area, which is about a quarter of an acre, drains to a single catch basin, which Aaron Aaron may be able to point to. Yep. And it enters that catch basin. And then it enters the, the, the first downstream structure, that round circle. That's a flow diversion structure. And its purpose is to the internal, and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna oversimplify this, not that this is really complicated, but I'm, I'm gonna oversimplify it. The purpose of that structure, the, in, the, the internal components of it are designed to direct the, the water quality volume computed in accordance with the Connecticut DEP stormwater quality manual to a stormwater treatment structure, which is the next downstream circle. Uh, exactly. So in that, in that flow diversion structure, the first circular structure, it's designed such that a certain flow rate has to go to the to the stormwater treatment structure and that flow rate is equated to the to the water quality volume if, if that flow rate goes to the stormwater treatment structure that means that the water quality volume the portion the early first portion of a rainfall event that contains by all by all standards of practice the vast majority of pollutants will go to that stormwater treatment structure. That stormwater treatment structure happens to be a hydrodynamic separator type. After this, the water quality volume of the rainfall event, that portion of the rainfall event passes through that stormwater treatment structure, it then goes downstream all the way to the constructed stormwater wetland. And Aaron is tracing the pipes down now. So, so that water quality volume passes through the stormwater treatment structure and then it gets directed to the constructed stormwater wetland around the perimeter of the pond or most of the perimeter of the pond. The, 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 the stormwater treatment structure is considered a secondary treatment practice in, in the Connecticut Stormwater Quality Manual. It is not adequate alone by itself to treat the stormwater runoff, to provide a high enough level of treatment. The stormwater wetland is considered a primary treatment practice and it is um, able to provide high levels of treatment. As I said in my response letter, and if you, if you read the stormwater quality manual, it's online and any, anybody can read it. If you read about stormwater wetlands, you will see that they, are, they have been um, described in the stormwater quality manual, Connecticut stormwater quality manual, as a primary treatment practice capable of providing high levels of, of, of treat, the treatment of stormwater for water quality. So what we have as, as, as described in our stormwater management report is a combination of a secondary treatment practice, the stormwater treatment structure, and a primary treatment practice, the constructed stormwater wetland used in combination or in a, in a the uh, common term is in a treatment train approach um, to treat the stormwater runoff. So that, again, that water quality volume, that small portion of the stormwater runoff that occurs in the beginning of a rainfall event that carries the vast majority, by, by all standards of practice, carries the vast majority of pollutants is directed to the flow diversion manhole. The flow diversion manhole directs it to the stormwater treatment structure. And from there, it goes to the constructed stormwater well. That's the water quality component of the stormwater management system. 
any 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 questions on on that at this point so um can can the agency still hear me i hope <laughs> yes okay yes so that's the water quality component of of the stormwater management system the other component of the stormwater management system deals with peak rates of discharge from the higher from the, the remaining portion of a rainfall event from the higher flow rates than the water quality flow. So as the water level, as the water surface builds up in elevation within the flow diversion structure that the Aaron's cursor is on, it starts to those higher flows that don't contain the majority of the pollutants in stormwater runoff are directed through that pipe that Aaron will follow to the subsurface stormwater detention system. The subsurface stormwater detention system has one function, to provide a storage reservoir that temporarily, sto temporarily stores those higher, the, the, the fraction or portion of stormwater runoff from a rainfall event uh, in the storage reservoir, the chambers below the ground, and it's metered out through an outlet control structure at a very at a much reduced rate than the rate it came in. And that outlet control structure is that square that Aaron's cursor is on. And from that outlet control structure, that portion of the stormwater runoff goes down the pipes to the constructed stormwater wetland. That's the stormwater management system in a nutshell. I, I know that may have been lengthy, but but that's the that is the stormwater management system in a nutshell. So so it was designed to capture the stormwater runoff from the parking area, the sidewalks, the majority of the driveway area, the the areas, the the, the land surface coverage types that would be carrying the most pollutants in stormwater runoff. It was designed to capture those, to treat it in the manner I described uh, through the stormwater treatment structure and the stormwater wetland. The higher flows go to the detention system and they're attenuated, their rates are, are much, much reduced. In fact, if you look at the stormwater management report, all, the rates for all the design storms from the two year rainfall event to the 100 year rainfall event, the, 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 the routed, what we call the routed peak discharge that comes out of the stormwater detention system is one half of a cubic feet, foot per second or less. This is a very small site, a very small drainage area. We're talking about very small flow rates. The building is the there's a pipe shown that that carries the building roof water from its gutter and rainwater leader system directly to the stormwater wetland it does not have to go to the stormwater treatment structure in fact it doesn't even have to go to the stormwater wetland and i explain this in in my response letter the connecticut dep considers roof water from roofs on non-industrial buildings that don't have some process going on inside the building and where vents penetrate through the roof. And for architectural, typical residential, um, architectural was the wrong word, typical residential roof construction materials as clean in terms of stormwater quality. We are, although we could by practice, discharge it directly to the pond. We're not, we're discharging it to the stormwater, the constructed stormwater wetland. So it, 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 it doesn't carry the same level of pollutants, of course, as a parking area. It doesn't have to go through the stormwater treatment structure. It doesn't even have to go to the constructed stormwater wetland. However, it, it makes sense to discharge it there practically 
and that's where it is shown to be discharged. The stormwater wetland does not provide a stormwater detention function. It's designed to provide a water quality function only. That's why there's a comment in the, in the review letter that there's no outlet control structure for the stormwater wetland. There, there, there is no need for an outlet control structure. It, it, the stormwater wetland provides a water quality function, not a stormwater detention function, if that, if that makes sense to the agency. Um, so, Aaron, could you zoom out to the whole site again? And I'll, I'll just, I'll finish this up with one, one last thing. This is, I think this is very important to note. Um, uh, let me, let me, let me say two more things about the stormwater management system very quickly. Um, there is a requirement in the Connecticut stormwater quality manual to compute the annual groundwater recharge volume. The, the purpose is to make sure that when you cover land with impervious surface, that you're, you're still trying to mimic the pre-development hydrology and, and you, want to make, you want to ensure that you introduce stormwater runoff back into the ground, back to the groundwater, that you, that you don't capture it and direct it away and not introduce it back into the groundwater on the site. That, that computation in our, in our stormwater management report is correct. It was noted in the review letter that it was that it's not correct. I'll just simply say, please read the manual to the agency members, and you will see that the computation is correct. Very simple computation. Um, there is another requirement in actually in the Connecticut General Stormwater Permit for construction activities and dewatering wastewaters that says, when you are when a stormwater discharge is to and within 500 feet of a tidal wetland, you should retain on the site the runoff volume generated from the first inch of rainfall. We have done that here in the constructed stormwater wetland. We've, we've also taken care of the groundwater recharge volume in the stormwater wetland also. The reason, the, the reason that we even mention that requirement in the Connecticut General Permit is that in the stormwater management report, you'll notice that a very small area comprised of lawn, mostly lawn and landscape areas, will drain out to Cottage and Mill Road and will enter the drainage system in Cottage and Mill and ultimately will be discharged to a tidal well. So we made sure that the constructed stormwater wetland can meet that requirement to retain uh, the runoff volume generated from the first inch of rainfall. I, the ground, again, the, there's, a, there's a comment in the, in the review letter that says that we haven't demonstrated that we're going to infiltrate the, the, um, the groundwater volume um, the computed groundwater volume. Um, as, I, as I said just a minute ago, the purpose of that requirement is to introduce, make sure that you introduce on an annual basis, a certain volume of stormwater runoff back to the groundwater. If you look at this site, um, the, the when the groundwater volume and the volume generated from the first inch of rainfall goes into the constructed stormwater wetland, it has nowhere to go on this site, but back into the groundwater. And this is, this is gonna lead me to the last topic, which is the overall um, hydrologic condition of this site. This site is a bowl. It today, today, stormwater runoff does not drain from this site to Mill Road or to Cottage Road. Stormwater runoff from this site also does not drain off site on anyone else's property. 
Aaron, can you zoom in on the um, the edge of the pond closest to the, I guess it would be the easterly property boundary. We added, we had the surveyor go back out and add topography around the north and northeast part of the pond. And as you can see, if, you, if the agency can see all those closed contour lines, the, the, the elevation of the ground at the rear property line is 11. The high water elevation of the pond is five. The elevation of the ground on 41 Cottage Road adjoining this parcel to the east, as you can see by those ground surface elevation contours, is goes all the way up to 11 also. In fact, it goes higher. We stopped at 11 because 11 is the lowest ground surface elevation at our rear property line. The pond would have to re remember that the high water elevation of the pond is approximately five. The pond would have to rise over six feet in elevation for stormwater runoff to leave this site and go out onto the property to the north. It, it's been, it had been said in earlier meetings that there was a water course, a surface water course outlet from this pond and that, it, and that this pond was connected to the Hammonasset River. It's clearly not. This topography shows that. Uh, a field walk uh, um, shows it immediately. As soon as you stand there, it can be easily seen that this whole site is down in a bowl. The pond happens to extend partially on the 41 Cottage Road property. The 41 Cottage Road property is owned by one of the members of the, of the LLC that is the applicant for this subject application on 35 Cottage Road. We, we understand that during the less frequent greater rainfall depths, like the 50 year event and the 100 year rainfall event, that the pond runoff from this site will cause, depending on the current groundwater conditions, may cause the pond's water surface to rise temporarily. And that will mean that there'll be a rise in the pond water surface on the 41 Cottage Road property. The way that that is commonly handled is an easement is created on both properties for cross drainage purposes. And that the, in the planning and zoning process, that easement document will be submitted to town staff for their review and review by the town's land use council. So if you could if you could zoom out, Aaron, just a just one more time to the whole site, and I'm I'm just about done. Um, again, this this site is a bowl. There is no surface water outlet from this site. The, the, the hydrologic analysis we did and, and engineering judgment shows that there is no way for stormwater runoff to impact an offsite property or an offsite hydraulic structure, meaning a culvert or a bridge or a storm drainage system or a watercourse channel or a swale. There, there's, there's no way for stormwater runoff from the site to, imp, to make those kind of impacts. We are changing the ground surface cover in the front, the southerly third or so of the site, as you can see, as you stare at it. We're, there, there are some buildings in that area. Uh, in the in the land surface coverage type and the and the you know going to an impervious is Mike cutting out for everyone? Yes. No. 
excuse me. I at least yeah. couldn't hear you. You were c coming, cutting in and out. Yeah, he, he disappeared on me. Okay. I still can't hear him. Yeah, are you talking, Mike? I'm. I think I'm back. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah now you can. Okay. I'll I'll try to wrap this up really quick. I don't know how much you heard of that. Um, the it it so the the lawn the proposed lawn behind the building is lawn today. The remainder of the site either stays lawn, or a lawn gets turned into a meadow or the wooded area gets turned into a meadow. And as noted, I won't go into the details, but as noted in our response letter, by inspection, an engineer reviewing this can, can see that the, there will be no change in the rates of peak discharge or the volume of runoff from the remaining portion of the site. There is a change, of course, where the parking area is to be built and where the building is to be built. So, but if you stare at the plan and you, and if you study the plan and you study the landscape plan specifically, you will see that behind the building, lawn area that's lawn today remains lawn. Some lawn area today gets converted to a meadow and some wooded area gets converted to a meadow. And again, an engineer reviewing it by inspection would be able to see that there will be no change in the peak rates of discharge. I did a, a computation for what would happen in the 100 year rainfall event. And this is the last thing I'll say about, about this. Um, what would happen in the 100 year rainfall event to the surface of that pond, the, the water surface elevation of that pond. And I made the assumption, and this is not how it works, but I made the very conservative assumption that the pond is a bathtub, like the bathtub in your house, and you compute the volume of runoff from that whole site that goes into that pond, even the volume of runoff from the adjoining site, adjoining sites actually, that goes into that pond. In the 100 year event, the computation shows that the pond water surface would rise about 15 inches. Again, that is not how this works. There, there's a lot of there's a lot more factors that go into what the rise in that water surface elevation of the pond would be, but even conservatively assuming that that pond was a bathtub or a swimming pool with a liner in it, and you added the volume of, of runoff, stormwater runoff generated from the 100 year event, the pond would only raise 15 inches. That 15 inch raise cannot affect anyone else's property. It can't affect a downstream hydraulic structure as I described before. And it's, it is a temporary condition, uh, the, the rise in the water surface elevation of the pond that goes back down as, as groundwater levels, as the rainfall event uh, goes away and as groundwater levels over time go back to their, to their normal level uh, um, depending on the, the time of year that the rainfall event happens. So that's the, that, that I think sums up what I had to say. Um, be glad to answer any questions. I actually hope the commission has some questions. Um, and I, and I hope that helped, especially the description of the stormwater management system and the hydrologic condition of the site. <clears throat> Mike, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, there was a flag raised about a, a well off premises being too close to the proposed septic. Was that addressed? Um, I can I can answer that, Joe. I'm not not in the not in my response letter because that was not included in the Trinkus Engineering um, okay. of review. But I, I'd be glad to respond to that. So so this is an interesting situation. Um, when we design septic systems, uh, whether it's a single family home in someone's backyard or a commercial or you know, multifamily residential project or a commercial project, um, uh, um, part of our due diligence is to look at where septic systems and wells are, water supply wells are 
uh, within a certain distance on adjoining property. So uh, we did that um, and, and we noted in our, in our work that we could, when we stood in Mill Road and looked into the yard, both the front and the back, the best we could see of 42 Mill Road, meet the adjoiner immediately to the north, we could not see an above grade well. You know how the, the well casing typically sticks up above grade. We also noted that as we walk on our property along the common boundary with 42 Mill Road to the north, we couldn't see it either in the backyard. Now, that doesn't mean the well's not there. There, the well could, could be a bus. Are, are, are in fact below grade and their casing and sanitary um, cap are not, you know, not current standards and not above grade. So because we couldn't see it, we researched the records of the town and we found the well completion report for the well showing its location based on distances to the house as the house was configured in 1976 when the well was installed. We looked at the house from the street and we noticed it, it was much larger than it appeared in 1976. So we went back into the town's records and got building department records of all the addition proposals that were made over the years. And between that data and orthophotography from the state, we were able to approximate where we think the well was constructed. When we went back out in the field, we noticed that in that area where we approximated it, there, there was a black fabric covering, I guess is the only way to describe it, on the ground bound with rope or twine or wire, I'm not sure, out in the middle of the lawn area in the rear, in the backyard, in the approximate location where we had computed the well location. So we laid out, when I designed the septic system, I took that approximate location into account. I laid out the leaching field such that should we in the future be able to determine where that well was exactly, that we'd be able to adjust the leaching field. There's a, uh, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I, I laid out the leaching fields um, to their maximum length. Um, it is possible in this particular situation to shorten the lengths of the leaching field fields and even eliminate the upper row and still meet the requirements of the technical standards of the state public health code. Should the actual documented location of that well be able to be determined? We went, we received recently within the past few days or actually, I'm sorry, late last week, a note from the town's director of health about the location of the well. And we went, I personally went back out and walked all along the common property boundary and still um, we cannot see a well above grade. However, we can still see the black covering on the ground in, in, in the area that we approximated. In an email sent to the director of health, the owner, I believe, the owner of 42 Mill Road included a photograph of the well with the well casing and a sanitary head um, sticking up above grade. In, in, in the lawn area, um, it, 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 in, in the backyard. Um, and I, all we can presume is that the well is actually under that black covering. So, so um, I believe we did our due diligence. We did what we were supposed to do. We tried to visually find the well. We researched the town's records. We've gone out there multiple times to visually look again uh, over the past six or eight months and have only seen the black covering in the lawn area and, and have never been able to observe what we saw in the photograph, which was a a typical installation with a well casing in the head, the sanitary head um, sticking up above grade. So, so if we're if we are able to locate that well exactly, and if we have to adjust the leaching fields, because I because of the way I designed it, 
uh, we can easily shorten the fields and or eliminate the upper row if we had to and still be in compliance with uh, the public health code and the intent of the design. The septic system, the leaching fields would not, would not get any closer to the pond or to the constructed stormwater wetland than uh, they are shown on our drawings today. I hope that helps. Thank you. Mike, um, I assume that you saw the Phoenix, Phoenix environmental borings and, and Mr. Landcourt's report. Did the, the information in that report change or augment any of uh, the information that you had when you did your design? No. No, not not at all. We and I and I and I'll tell you why. And Mr. Langcor explained this. We, well, I'm sure he did. I may have lost internet during his part of his um, his presentation. Um, we designed, as you know, uh, I think you know, we designed this subsurface sewage disposal system in accordance with the requirements of the technical standards of the Connecticut Public Health Code. Right. And and those standards, those standards of practice uh, do not uh, require the level of investigation and the kind of data and data that was collected and analysis that was that was uh, performed by, by Mr. Lancor. So well, I no, guess my question it, is the data regarding the soil conditions and the hydrology was that consistent with the assumptions that you used in designing for the you know, in accordance with the Department of Public Health. Yeah, yes, I may, I may have misunderstood your question. I'm sorry. Um, yes, the certainly the borings, the soil borings, um, you know, showed the same uh, soil characteristics and groundwater, deep groundwater elevations that um, that we found when we did our excavated test pits. So it that that data confirmed um, that type of work that we did, if that if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Thanks. Um, any any other questions from the agency? Nope. Okay. So um, thank you for listening. I'm sorry that took so long and. Uh, I will um, I will um, leave this back with uh, Attorney Shansky um, to to um, um, see where we go next. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think uh, Abigail Adams for a moment to uh, show the uh, revised landscape plan, please. Good evening. For the record, my name is Abigail Adams, registered landscape architect, owner A2 Land Consulting out of New Fairfields, Connecticut. Um, I'm just going to share my screen super quickly, and then I'll get right to it. Okay, um, I just want to start off with the fact that the, um, the planting plan is um, very extensive and we have even modified it to provide a 25 foot wide buffer around the entire pond on our portion of the property. And as you can see in other locations, it's much wider than the 25 feet for the septic area, I just wanted to note that the material that's in this area that we're removing, there's some small small trees in there, some scrubby material, Japanese knotweed, et cetera. That's material that will be removed for that. And then over in this portion of the property, uh, lightly more wooded, but that has black locust, tree of heaven, also some Japanese knotweed and some other invasives in that area. So all of that material is going to be removed and we're going to be replacing that as Mr. Odd had mentioned with uh, the installation of a NOMO mix in a significant portion of the property. What's not planted in this buffer and these uh, larger pockets of tree and shrub plantings is going to be a NOMO mix. And here's, 
here's the line right here, as you can see on the plan. This is the separation line between the, the maintained lawn area that we have around the perimeter of the building for the residents. This would be the designated NOMO line and all of this material here would be that mix which gets mown just once a year, it's no more mix, but it gets mown once a year and um, either in June or the late fall. And then it will grow up and will significantly reduce the rate of the overland flow, also helps um, to reduce pollutants and uh, creates wildlife um, cover. Um, we're proposing a mix of herbaceous plants, woody material, deciduous and evergreen material. A significant amount of that material is native. Uh, let's see here. I, um, I also want to reiterate that the addition of this buffer, in my professional opinion, is a significant and beneficial environmental improvement by adding native wildlife habitat coverage, slowing overland flow, and helping to, again, remove uh, pollutants. So um, I, I presented the whole landscape plan um, a couple of times, but um, I just wanted to reiterate some of those major points. And again, to show that we have really beefed up this buffer around the pond, where right now we have just maintained lawn all the way down to the pond you can just see from this plan how significant uh, an improvement it is with all of this native plantings, um, the ornamental grasses, the herbaceous, and um, everything that's happening in this created wetland. So I think those are the key points that I, I wanted to um, remind everybody of. I had a question. Yes. Um, I think if I was reading the right document, um, you have a very detailed maintenance plan, right? Yes. Okay. Um, so it, you have, um, I just had a question on you in years one and two in September, you say that there will be an assessment of survival of these plants and they'll be replaced. Who, who's doing that? And is it dead and dying or just dead? It, didn't, it was a little vague on what would be replaced. Uh, sure, um, that would either be done by myself, by Eric Davidson, by a professional um, environmental, by an environmental professional um, who's qualified to do that. Again, myself or, um, Mr. Davidson, we would go out there and we would do that uh, report, that assessment, and we would provide that report to uh, the town or the commission, wh whichever you choose. And um, typically, if a ma material looks as though it's dying and will not bounce back, that it is not thriving, we would recommend that it would be replaced. If something's dead, we would replace it. That's typically how I do it. If it's something that looks like, okay, if we give this in, if we give this guy another year, then it will go. A lot of times on my report, I'll, I'll mark it as to be watched or looks like it's in decline, may need replacement the following year, something along those lines. So we have an indication of, of how it's doing. And um, that's great, thank you. Uh, I had another question I had, it sounds like this plan is um, a five-year maintenance plan. Is that right? Yes. So what happens after that? You have a lot of plantings and I, and, and I assume this is including the constructed wetland? Yes. And so in my experience with some constructed wetlands that we've had done in town, once they're not being actively maintained, they often just turn into Phragmites. And so I wondered after five years, what happens? Well, typically with something like this, it, there's the maintenance plan what's, which says what needs to be done on a yearly basis, but there's also the monitoring plan and report that goes to town that's for the five years. So it's almost like two separate things. 
So the maintenance and monitoring are happening during the first five years. And then after the five years, we're not monitoring it anymore, but the maintenance plan should continue to be in place. Okay. But it wasn't clear. It, it, it sounded like there was a five-year endpoint. Okay. And, and I, it, you know, as I'm sure you know well, when plants are not actively maintained, oh, they yes. do all kinds of things. This is true. Living creatures just like us, right? Other questions for Ms. Adams? No. Nope. Thank you. Thank you, Abigail. Eric Davison, please. know what's going on here. Eric, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. I'm here, Marjorie. Sorry. That's okay. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I, I submitted a letter uh, to um, the commission in response to um, the last uh, intervention um, um, the, the experts, uh, the interveners experts uh, at the last hearing, uh, my letter was dated January 19th. Um, I attempted in that letter to cover the comments that the interveners had as well as some of the questions uh, that the uh, commission raised and then a few of um, some of the repeating themes I think that some of the neighbors had raised. So hopefully I, I cover those and I'll, I'll go through these as quickly as I can. But of course, if there are lingering questions, please let me know. <clears throat> um, the beginning of my uh, response letter is focused on the stormwater treatment design, which um, Mr. Ott has gone through uh, in, in great detail. So I think I just wanted to talk about it in more general terms. Um, the idea being that, um, you know, we, we've really gotten into the weeds, uh, for lack of a better phrase, about how the stormwater system works. Uh, I really think it's just important to focus on the fact that you know, the design is uh, in compliance with the, the Connecticut Stormwater Manual's primary treatment practice. And that, as my, Mr. Ott said, is, is the sort of the, the best scenario you can have in terms of design of the stormwater system that will treat um, pollutants that uh, discharge from, uh, that just discharge from developed areas. Uh, you know, the, the main, the main um, mechanisms for that are, um, you know that that these systems capture sediment um, and they can and capture um, pollutants through adsorption, uh, biological uptake, photo degradation, uh, and microbial breakdown, and all of that occurs in the in the design soil material that you put into the stormwater basin and the vegetation that goes along with it. So, uh, the primary treatment design is really the top of the line design that you can uh, install with a development uh, like this. And they could be standalone treatments. And as Mike indicated, uh, in this case, we've got redundancy in the fact that we have a treatment train that include that also includes some mechanical treatment like hydrodynamic separators um, as well. So this is you you, you can't do a stormwater design uh, in terms of um, efficiency of treatment better than what's proposed here. Um, again, I, I just to just to step back and focus on, on sort of the big picture here. This is an application with no direct wetland impacts. It's an existing developed site with no direct wetland impacts. And in, in my opinion, no real alteration uh, in the condition or quality of the upland review area impacts through conversion of what is a low quality upland review area or wetland buffer, which is now lawn and some landscaping and converting that to some additional development. So I think that's just sort of getting, again, getting lost in some of the technical details here that we've got a developed site uh, and uh, this, this is a redevelopment with no direct impacts. Um, I stated in my letter and I, I think I mentioned this on the first, at the first meeting, I'll reiterate it again. Um, you know, there are really two wetland systems that this site drains to. 
Um, one of them, again, is, a, is a, as we discussed before, is a critical resource. It's the Hammonasset um, River tidal wetlands of regional significance. And then you have the on-site pond, uh, which as we stated um, many times has uh, very limited functions and values. It's essentially a, a man-made uh, suburban pond. Um, and, and the whole focus of the stormwater system was to capture and treat the stormwater up on site as, as Mike described, um, which provides full protection and no downstream impacts to those critical resources, which are the tidal wetlands. Um, another issue, uh, another, I think another fact that's sort of getting lost in, in, in the details here is that, you know, there's been a lot of concern raised by the uh, interveners over nitrogen impacts to the pond. Um, one of the primary contributing sources of nitrogen and phosphorus to the pond at present is the maintained lawn that basically surrounds the entire pond. Uh, we're proposing to convert a lot of that lawn to plantings. Um, we're converting uh, 8, 000, approximately 8,700 square feet of lawn to native plantings with now another 3,600 square feet. That's lawn that will be converted to, to a planted stormwater basin. basin. And then, and we're also converting a lot of the remaining lawn to what, what's called no mow lawn mix, and that's going to be another approximately fourteen thousand square feet. So, those are significant numbers in terms of in terms of converting existing lawn to uh, all environmentally friendly plantings that uh, do not require water, <coughs> significant watering, fertilizing, <coughs> or um, pesticide or, or uh, herbicide applications once they're established. Um, there's been a few mentions, and also I think it was in uh, the REMA report, um, the discussion of the fact that this septic leaching field is going to be installed in an area that's now vegetated um, in basically in the northwest corner of the site, northwest of the pond, uh, where the uh, septic leaching fields proposed, uh, as well as the, um, the septic leaching field, as well as the um, um, alternate leaching field. Um, this area is, was originally characterized as, as being for, you know, sort of mature forest and, and undisturbed, and that's just simply not the case. Uh, I know that there was a site walk done and some of the commissioners looked at this area, but um, that area is mostly open canopy. It's small trees. Um, it uh, does not have um, a mature forest um, characteristics. Um, and, and the, um, the ground surface um, does not have habitat that we would generally consider suitable for amphibians in the long term. It doesn't have a well-developed duff layer. Um, there's not a lot of debris um, or sufficient um, cover objects. Um, so it, it's, I think it's just been mischaracterized. It's mostly invasive species uh, and mostly small immature trees. There's some history of soil disturbance in there. So uh, I, I would not characterize that area as being um, high quality amphibian habitat when you're, when you're looking at what the value is for amphibians during their terrestrial life stage. <clears throat> um, there was a lot of discussion about the limitations of the pond sampling, which again, I think has is, is just been overstated. Um, um, just to summarize what we did um, in terms of pond surveys, we started our pond survey, survey on April 8th. That was a visual survey during optimal weather conditions. And that's where we identified some egg masses uh, before we did the full egg mass count. Um, that's where we identified other things like the snapping turtle. Uh, we did some um, dip net sampling along the shoreline on that April 8th um, visit. So it was a pretty thorough, thorough shoreline sampling. <clears throat> Later in May is when we did the more detailed sampling, which was an in-water sampling. And there was some criticism that we didn't take a small boat or a kayak, but uh, when you're sampling a small pond, all of the biological material and the, the biological activity, where you would look to identify the species richness and, and basically the, the importance of the pond is all in the shallow water, mostly in the littoral shelf and the areas bordering the, the pond edges. If you have a 10 foot deep suburban pond, there, there's not much in the way of biological life in the bottom few feet. You might get, uh, in the case of a pond that supports fish, some activity of fish when it's during the hotter months. But you know, the, the idea that we would need to get into the pond and sample down to a depth of eight or 10 feet is just 
it, it would not provide any additional information. We, we did a pretty thorough weighting and sampling using a, a hundred foot seine, which captured, um, in my opinion, everything that would be of importance to document with respect to what the commission would need to understand um, to make a decision about what the impacts of the development would be on the pond. Um, <clears throat> just to comment on the issue of the fact that we didn't do macro invertebrate sampling, which basically is sampling the invertebrates that live in the pond bottom or in some of the pond vegetation. Again, this is just not a, not a standard practice that you would uh, employ for a, um, a situation like this. There are methodologies for doing macro invertebrate sampling um, for streams. Uh, and there's a well-documented methodology that both the EPA and the Connecticut DEP has for documenting stream invertebrate uh, habitat and basically categorizing what invertebrates live in those stream systems and, and what the quality of the stream is based on the macroinvertebrates that are present. There is no similar methodology that's readily accepted for macroinvertebrate sampling per pond. So, I just, again, I, I think it's, it's asking for data just for asking for, it's asking for data that, that doesn't provide any additional information that, that I think the commission could use to effectively make a decision. It just doesn't, it, it doesn't add anything to the decision-making process in my opinion. Um, there's a significant amount of comments in the, in the public, uh, during, during the public comments and also with the REMA report with respect to wildlife impacts um, I, I don't recall who made the comment, but there was there was a comment, or I think several comments about the lack of amphibian survey over multiple years. I think someone had suggested that there should be a three-year survey period for uh, amphibian egg masses. We certainly do that type of work. I mean, we have uh, sampling sites where we're on, you know, years, you know, eight eight to ten on 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 sites where you know there's a purpose for that long-term sampling. But in the case of doing, you know, uh, you know, what we would consider as sort of a one season assessment in support of a development application, it just doesn't happen. I mean, think about the logistics of asking applicants to, you know, where they have a pond or a vernal pool to survey for three years before they come in for an application. It's just not realistic uh, in a municipal permitting environment. There were a lot of comments about migratory birds um, using the pond. Um, I, I certainly would not argue with that. Um, had I visited the pond over you know multiple months and multiple seasons, I, I would certainly expect that. You know, we we all anybody who lives along the shoreline like like you folks do and like I do know that there's a significant concentration of of migratory birds uh, along the Connecticut coast, especially in Madison. So um, there's no question that the pond's going to get used seasonally by migratory birds, especially wading birds and other uh, waterfowl that are moving along the coast. Um, but I just, I don't, you know, there's gonna be some increased activity in this, on the site after it's developed, but one of the biggest limitations for birds using uh, uh, an open water site is what is the surrounding vegetation. Um, when it's lawn, um, it does not offer a lot of cover for birds and it does not offer a lot of uh, perch sites for birds that like feed on the, on the edge of the water and then perch uh, between feeding opportunities. Um, so having, you know, having a pond that's surrounded by lawn, it's, it's great for geese, but not great for a lot of other birds. So I actually think the plantings, once they're well established, will, will improve some of the bird habitat that you see there, um, especially since it's migratory and not breeding. Um, Um, I, I'm not going to comment on the vernal pool. I, I had some comments about some of the vernal pool issues in my letter, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to my letter and, and leave it to Dr. Clemens, given the lateness of the hour, and I know he's going to cover these things uh, in detail. Um, <clears throat> I think um, just one last thing to touch on that I think actually uh, the chairwoman had, had asked about was a little a bit of additional detail on the functions and values of the wetland. Um, and how those might be affected uh, by the development. I, I did in my original report um, that was submitted with the application um, that was done back in September, um, I did detail in that, in that report um, what I thought the principal functions and values of the wetlands uh, are. Um, I identified groundwater recharge and discharge, which we've heard a lot about today, how, how the groundwater interacts with the pond surface water and, and, and um, 
you know, what the pond's role is um, sort of as a, as a local um, flood control resource uh, or resource for capturing both groundwater and surface water. You've heard, heard a lot about that today. Uh, I, I just don't see, as Mike described, you know, what the hydrologic changes will be to the pond um, based on the stormwater design. You're not going to see any drastic change to how um, how uh, surface water and groundwater interact with the pond. So I just don't see any issue to that, any, any impact to that particular principal function uh, of groundwater recharge and discharge. Again, the flood flow alteration function of the pond is very localized since it has no downstream connection, but it does serve to capture um, some surface water from all the surrounding development and, and alleviate some. Um, um, flooding issues, um, which which we know there are some issues with flooding along that street during during periods of heavy rain. So again, I don't see any impact to that flood flow alteration function. Um, I had also identified sediment um, toxicant and pathogen retention function and nutrient removal uh, function um, that the pond um, offers um, with the, the stormwater design as proposed. That that function will actually increase the ability for the pond and, and this associated wetland that we're constructing around the pond, the ability, ability for that system after everything is established, uh, will it'll have a more efficient uh, capability of, um, of treating uh, stormwater um, um, pollutants. Um, <clears throat> the last um, principal function I had identified was wildlife habitat uh, and, and the associated production export. Um, I did mention that um, there is a small population of spotted salamanders on the, uh, in the pond. Uh, I don't see, um, and again, Dr. Clemens is gonna go into this in detail. I don't, I don't see that as being a critical function of this wetland or, or even a, a long-term bio, a function that has long-term viability. Uh, I really see that the primary wildlife function here is for uh, suburban and urban species, um, mostly the ones that we documented, which are common um, common frog species that uh, do have um, you know, high biomass <clears throat> in that pond, and that's the primary production export of the pond, but I don't see any impact to that function being that those species are all well adapted to, uh, to environments that uh, have you know, varying water, water quality and varying um, um, value to the, up, to the wetland buffers themselves. Um, again, I think the big picture here is uh, I just don't see a, a significant adverse impact to the wetlands, given that we have no direct impact. We've got an existing developed site, and, and in my opinion, a, a suburban pond that has very little um, value um, across the, the suite of things you would consider in terms of wetland functions and values. Um, there's a few other comments in my letter regarding issues relating to nitrogen. Um, and septic effluent. Uh, Mark and, and Mike touched on that in such detail that I, I won't, I, I, given, given how long the night is going, I, I don't think there's, it's necessary for me to read through those. But uh, if, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, any questions for Mr. Davison? I'm all set. All right. Thank you. Dr. Clemens. I think you're on mute still. No, I'm not. Thank you for unmuting me. <clears throat> Good evening. I'm uh, Michael Clemens, PhD in conservation biology and ecology, and I'm a herpetologist and with over 46 years of experience um, working here in Connecticut. And uh, this particular application is sort of like so many that I see, somehow 830G applications seem to have an affinity for fernal pools or so-called fernal pools. And as I think because they are mysterious, 
subject to a lot of interpretation and I attempted to address that in 2002 using with the Calhoun and Clemens manual, which I think has been introduced into the record. In part, it was to help communities distinguish what are good viable variables. But if you read the manual and subsequent publications, it was as much to guide people, agencies, individuals, developers into what's not a viable vernal pool. Um, and I think this is why we keep getting into this loop. Vernal pool or not vernal pool. Viable vernal pool or not a viable vernal pool. And this has become such an epidemic of dueling consultants. This was, I think I devoted five or six pages in my latest book, Amphibians, Conservation of Amphibians and Reptiles uh, in Connecticut, which I'm the senior author on and Mr. Davison is one of the junior authors trying to get science to actually shed some light and guide people such as yourselves. There's a chapter in the book that is actually devoted to local decision makers because you and these commissions have an incredibly difficult and challenging job trying to sort through the data, trying to sort through the credibility and experience of the witnesses. I'm also a local decision maker, as I think I stated. As a matter of fact, I was just able to get out of my meeting and public hearings, which began at five o'clock. And through the beauty of Zoom, I can fly down from Salisbury, Connecticut to Madison uh, in a click of a switch and be with you at 7.30. I don't even know if there's been so much discussion the chair has admonished everyone to be civil and polite. Yet I find it very difficult. When I came into this hearing, I had a huge missive from Rima to go through. I had to print it and try to make sense of it while trying to pay attention to the hearing. I think I'd managed to actually have some rebuttal points. Let's begin with vernal pool, not vernal pool. Foundationally, a vernal pool as defined by your regulations is a seasonal, not in this case, generally shallow body of water, again, not in this case, in a defined depression or basin. Yes, in this case, lacks a fish population. Well, I think we've heard testimony there may be there, they certainly were there in the past. And most importantly, is capable of supporting breeding and development of amphibians. And it's that last part where I really think you fail the test. Um, I don't believe this, this pond as it is, is capable of supporting a viable long-term population of amphibians. If I were to take your regulations and strictly interpret them, I would say end of discussion. This is not a vernal pool under the town of Madison's inland wetlands definitions. However, as has been my practice, and I pride myself on being consistent application to application, that I take an expansive view of what might be a vernal pool. And I include wetlands such as this and that is why I conducted the analysis that I did. Now, I don't know where Mr. Logan has been reading in my report, but it's discuss all about the vernal pool envelope. He says, never is there a discussion about the vernal pool envelope, but I guess we can't get my report up on the screen, can we? Is it possible? I don't screen share. I'm, you know, I'm not from that generation. I ask others to it. But I think it's very important that most of what I talk about is about the vernal pool envelope. 
Yeah, great. Can we just scroll right down to the map at the end? There we go. Thank you. So basically, all this discussion is about the envelope because that's really where the development is and that's what's primarily on this property. So for Mr. Logan to state that is somewhere at the end that um, never said anything about the vernal pool envelope, I respectfully disagree. This is all the discussion has been about the vernal pool envelope. <clears throat> So I looked at the pre-development landscape and the present condition of the envelope is that is 32% developed and as 29% is manicured lawn. So basically altogether we have a 45% loss of the envelope, sorry, loss of the critical terrestrial habitat, which is your second tier. So based on the landscape alone, you have a pool that is between tier two and tier three based on the existing landscape value. I disagree that Mr. Logan's contention, it's a tier one. And the only way you can make it a tier one in his mind is to count the lawn, which he now says he didn't. So I'm totally confused how Mr. Logan arrived at the tier rating. Now it's been my practice in mapping, if you could scroll down a bit, please, so we see the whole pool. Oh, up, I'm sorry, excuse me. It's been my practice, thank you. Basically exclude manicured lawns in my development analyses because they're relatively devoid of value for vernal pool species. If we go to the photographs, please, which follow this map in my report. Here we have the pond. As you've heard, lawn all the way down to the edge, no vegetation, it's a lawn. And as Mr. Davison has testified, probably has inputs of nutrients to the pond. Look at the next picture, please. We'll see the piece of the forest that is going to be cleared as part of the plan to put the septic system. We've heard testimony that the quality of that forest is poor. Nonetheless, I think it's very important if we go back to the uh, map, please, to understand that post-development, the actual vernal pool, that whole brown area, is all going to be converted into habitat, planted habitat. And at my recommendation, that we now have a 25-foot buffer around the entire vernal pool, which basically follows the the industry standard that you basically, at minimum, need a 25 foot vegetative buffer around a wetland. I'm not gonna get into varying testimony from project to project. I began my interactions with Mr. Logan in Wilton. And those familiar with wetland cases know Avalon Bay versus Wilton. Uh, that was probably one of the first of the big vernal pool cases where upland habitat was debated. In that particular instance, the vernal pool in question had both spotted salamanders and wood frogs in very large populations, over 25 egg masses per individual and per pool. Um, but the catch here was that the critical upland habitat was off the site. And that was the beginning of a cascade of court cases in which I have been involved in almost every one of the major cases. Avalon Bay 1, Avalon 2, 
followed by Riverbend. Um, not the Unistar, that was Mr. Logan's case. And then basically River Sound, which conclusively linked the value of the upland habitat to wood frogs, the presence of wood frogs. I agree that this is Mr. what Mr. Davison saw. He did adequate sampling of this pool. He's saying, and I disagree again with Mr. Logan, that you don't capture larva by saning. Uh, I've saned many ponds and gotten large amounts of larva in my 46 years of work. I believe that of the 24 egg masses that were deposited, the resultant saning in May we left resulted in two larvae, each with missing tails. The simplest explanation, or as we call in science, Oakham's razor or the law of parsimony, is something was eating the larva to look like that. Not only were they eating the larva, parts of them, they were reducing their overall ecological fitness. The resources in the tail of the larva are very important to fuel metamorphosis of these salamanders. So from what I saw from the data, which I was asked to look at, was yes, there were 24 egg masses. And yes, as Mr. Logan speculates, some years they could maybe be 26 and some years there could be 20. But the result is that the survivorship is just not there. It's not there in the pond because of the competition from bullfrogs, which again, I discussed uh, the um, paper that Mr. Logan cited as stating the Semlich paper at all, stating that bullfrogs are not impediments to Ambistum um, immaculatum survivorship Quite to the contrary, I don't know if we were reading the same paper because that paper was quite conclusive in the impacts of these large ranids, uh, particularly bullfrogs on spotted salamander survivorship. As a scientist, I can only really look at what the data are. I believe the data were adequate to reach a conclusion, but let's go back and talk about the landscape. Um, the landscape is not going to support metamorphosis. There are no, there's no cover. And if we, I hate to do this again, Aaron, if you could pull up the report again, please. And we go to the last sets of photographs. There's something else that the agency should be aware of. Not only is there a lawn, but here we have, but basically, and we just go through those last pictures, please, Aaron just go down or keep scrolling. The dispersal of neonate metamorphs, if they exist, is limited by this impediment that stretches across the entire property. You have a wall. So all the discussion about dispersal and impediment is rather a moot point. The current situation is even if the salamander survived, it's never going to get beyond the lawn because it's blocked by the current conditions. So what have we done? We've basically tried to improve the condition of that 25 feet plus around the wetland. Um, I actually read that the chair asked us to look at the paper that she co-authored which was extremely interesting. And there were a lot of interesting things in there, including the whole issue of nitrogen and increased eutrophication, actually boosting wood frog production, which I found interesting. It was something that I learned. But I think most importantly, at the very end, one of the key takeaway messages was the need 
to put buffers around suburban ponds. It's the very last lines of the paper and we downloaded it from the Yale site. And it's not the actual paper, it's the accepted manuscript. So it goes by actual lines, but it's the very last lines where it's stated. And I agree. Yeah, actually lines 419 and 420. The critical need to monitor freshwater habitats, improve wastewater management, and establish and enforce buffer zones to better protect our freshwater ecosystems. That's exactly what has been done. We have created this of where there is long, there is now buffer. Whether that buffer can substantively assist this greatly impaired population of spotted salamanders, if they get through the gauntlet of predation and get out on land, they'll have a better chance of surviving. Um, I don't know if they do. The two that we found in the seining were not. When you lose the tail of a spotted salamander, they can't move around very well. They're limited in their ability to capture prey, they're vulnerable to predation, and a large amount of the energy to fuel metamorphosis is lost. That is the what's stored in the tail. So for the reasons that I've stated, I don't believe that this is a productive vernal pool, even under my expanded generous definition of what I call a vernal pool. I believe what is being done in my best professional judgment, it's going to improve the overall situation for any wildlife in that pool. Certainly shrubbery, grass, herbaceous material around the pool is going to enhance its desirability for wildlife, birds, especially small migratory birds. That's really what I have to say. I think it is unfortunate over and over again in opposing 830G applications to find these poor vernal pools dragged into the mix. Sometimes they're really valid vernal pool arguments. And at those times I've often worked on the side of interveners, but this is not a valid vernal pool argument. Please see this for what it is. It's not a vernal pool. It can't be a vernal pool uh, for all the ecological conditions. It's a wetland. And I believe that this application is going to try to remedy some of the issues to make the wetland have greater integrity. Um, and that's really what I have to say. I'm not gonna get into an ad hominem back and forth with Mr. Logan. This is false, this is true. The chair has asked us not to do a point counterpoint and I'm not doing it. The hour is late. I've said what I've had to say. And if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Um, I actually have a question and it's more, I just wanna make sure it's clear for our minutes and I should have stopped you earlier. Um, earlier on when you were talking about um, that this pond is not uh, viable for amphibian populations. I'm assuming you meant spotted salamanders. Absolutely. Thank okay, you for, I just want to make sure you. that's clear because obviously I there's more that. Green frogs. That, yes, it's not viable for spotted salamanders. It's highly viable for bullfrogs and green frogs. In fact, it has that heightened biomass that you refer to in many of the suburban ponds you study that there's a bit, very high biomass of, of anoran larva, herbaceous. Yeah. yeah, but thank you. I, yeah. I appreciate that. Well, good, thanks. I, it'll make our minutes easier to go through yes. next month. Are there any other questions for Dr. Clemens? No questions. OK. 
Okay, so Attorney Shansky, do we have anybody else from your team? Uh, no, uh, no, Madam Chair, I just uh, would make a few comments uh, in closing. Um, in spite of um, uh, our Mr. Davison's discussion about, um, and I guess Dr. Clemens, about the benefits to um, migratory birds and such from the buffer and um, improvement to the wetland boundary, I, I want to remind the, the agency that under 22A41D and section 10.6, of your regulations, the agency shall not deny or condition an application for a regulated activity in an area outside wetlands or watercourses on the basis of an impact or effect on aquatic plant or animal life, unless such activity will likely impact or affect the physical characteristics of such wetlands or watercourses, which to a man or woman, our team has opined is not the case. There are no adverse impacts associated with this development. Uh, Madam Chair, I would be remiss not to include a few comments on the record about your advice to us to read the Holgerson article that you and others wrote in 2017 and that uh, has been entered into the record. Um, and- uh, I wanna make sure, I, I didn't, I, I'm fine that you bring it up, but you asked, I, I mean, I suggested that there were papers you could read. I you didn't have to read it, but that's okay. Wasn't it wasn't like you have to read this, but that's fine. Understood. Uh, however, however it came to be identified um, by name and and authorship and such, I'm simply making the observation that we all did read it, um, and that um, while the article discusses change, it from our perspective, doesn't really discuss impact, uh, which is a salient distinction. And it certainly is not an article about this pond. And it's not a, an article about the facts and circumstances in this application. And in fact, in some respects, the article is interesting um, and as um, full of information as it is, is inconclusive uh, and recites to a need for further research to answer a variety of questions concerning suburban ponds and nitrogen. So uh, I, I say that all simply to say that however it became uh, part of these proceedings, it is not relevant from our perspective to the application and its review by the agency. I don't want to run afoul of 22A42C um, or the uh, Holdings and Grimes versus Conservation Commission 243 Connecticut 266. But I am obligated to simply state all of that for the record uh, while the hearing is open. Uh, and then finally, uh, Madam Chair and members of the agency, we're grateful for your time and attention. Uh, we have given you an analysis under 22A uh, 41A and section 10.2 of your regulations of the absence of impact, no direct wetlands uh, disturbance, and each of the professionals, um, Mr. Davison, Mr. Ott, Mr. Lancor, Ms. Adams, and Dr. Clemens has provided reports into this record, which they have discussed and which to, to each of them uh, winds up with the conclusion of, in some cases, from Dr. Clemens and um, Mr. Lancor, and indeed from Ms. Adams to the extent that she talked about uh, increased habitat and other protections and stormwater treatment. Uh, we are leaving, we with this development, will leave the site better than we find it. And, and, and that's a wonderful thing. Um, just looking at my notes uh, and subject to any final comment of rebuttal that might be necessary after uh, what comes next, uh, we thank you indeed for your time and attention. Okay, thank you. Um, do any of the agency members, while we're still here with the applicant, um, have any questions? Any questions? I know we went through each individual, but in light of Attorney Shansky's kind of closing remarks, are there any other questions? 
No questions. No, I don't have any questions. I think uh, based on all the plans we've seen and the, the responses, I think they've gone above and beyond to protect the pond as a habitat. The commissioner, attorney Vilcek, uh, I did ask uh, you know, to have an opportunity uh, to have a, a final uh, say and maybe have attorney, I mean, to have uh, Mr. Logan and Mr. Trinkus provide some kind of rebuttal because the uh, applicant provide uh, basically disclosed two new experts since uh, Mr. Logan and Mr. Trinkus. And it's kind of unfair uh, as interveners, we're a legal entity, we're allowed to present uh, rebutters, uh, to present somebody to rebut our legal experts, to rebut any new experts that may be disclosed after the fact. So, okay, I'm not quite sure. They, they, they're new experts, I believe, but or in response to your 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 initial comments, so um, I we can so Aaron, where can I mean this is I, I so what you're setting up here is they said something and I'm saying something and really the way this is structured is they had their say at one of the first public hearings, you submitted your comments. They have come back and provided answers to those comments. If you would like to have five minutes, you can have five minutes. Mr. Um, Trinkus and Mr. Um, um, uh, Trinkus and Mr. Logan, uh, because they, once again, they're uh, two new experts. And once again, you know, I, I'd rather have it out in the open now than opposed to say that it's on appeal. I rather uh, get the information disclosed now as a, and have the opportunity. Okay, just a second. So Lee, did you have something to say? Oh, you're muted, Bill. You're muted, Lee. I'm sorry, I have a question that, that's kind of in between, and that is um, Mr. Landcore's report did have uh, a lot of additional information because he went out and did borings and uh, gathered a lot more data. So I, I would at the very least be interested in whether or not any of that additional data changed or modified what Mr. Trinkus had to say in, in, his, in his report, um, which leads to something else for the record. Maybe I couldn't find it in the documents, but I couldn't find the attachments to Mr. Landcourt's report in, in the document documents were they there aaron and i just didn't see them because there's Here attachment a b and c i think to his report so there uh that may have been as part of attorney shansky's letter um the ex the uh, attachments but yes the report uh miss uh clemens report is um not Mr. Clement. No, no, no. Oh, excuse Land me. Um, Landcourt's Land report from Dimar is is in the record and incorporated. Um, and uh, I, I, will I found make... the report. I just didn't find the attachments. Okay, yeah. I, I will double check. Those attachments were were submitted as part of the record. Um, I, I would did have the, to look did through. Did the interveners get that information? Do you know? Yes. Oh. Yes. The All of the information that was submitted. Um, when, so anyway, Kayla, okay, well, that's my question uh, because there is there is more data, and uh, uh, I'd be interested if if that changed Mr. Trinkus any of his opinion any of his opinions. So. Madam Chair, if I may just say that this is Marjorie Shansky. That when we communicated all of the reporting to the town, I simultaneously sent them to Mr. Bilchak. Oh, good. good. Well, that's had fine. For every bit as long as the town has. And when we received correspondence from Mr. Belchek at 614 and 641 this evening, those were responses from Mr. Trinkus and Mr. Logan and Mr. Lancor and Mr. Ott and Ms. and uh, Mr. Davison attempted to respond to their responses within the body of their testimony this evening. So uh, I think the circle has been closed, but thank you. 
Well, I didn't see those letters, so I don't know whether Mr. Trink has addressed the new data, new data yeah, or, we, we or didn't, not. We didn't have, I mean, I yeah. looked at them during part of this because, but, you know, that's pretty late for yeah. a 10 o'clock meeting. Aaron, do you have any? Um, as as um, Attorney Shansky referenced and Attorney Bilchek, new information from the intervener was, uh, as far as reports were submitted this evening um, after the six o'clock hour, um, and those documents are submitted for the record. Um, and in my opinion, it is uh, within the discretion of uh, the commission as to whether or not you will entertain any further rebuttal from the intervener uh, beyond uh, the applicant's closing statements. Well, uh, excuse me. I, the, the agency, just to clarify, has 35 days from uh, the close of a public hearing to review application uh, documents uh, prior to making um, any decisions. Uh, there are no decisions that are expected this evening. Um, however, um, if, if reports have been submitted to, and, and the commission has no need for additional information, um, then yes, you may close the public hearing. So um, Lee and John and um, Joe, you know, how do you, Lee, would you like to hear from Mr. Trinkin? No, I mean, if he submitted a letter and we, we don't have to decide tonight and we have to, the next meeting, his right. his rebuttal is is in the record, and I can read it. That's fine. Yes. That's yeah. that's so, fine. So we've got two letters that are now in the record, and and that do go and rebut. So we we do have, and for Mr. Logan as well. So we have both of those, and I I skimmed them, um, but already tonight. But we can look at those. John or Joe, comments. So, so I may have missed it. Is uh, are we? Are we bringing in two items that were submitted at 6.05 today well, via email? They're, they're in the record. So they're in the record. Yep. We're not going to make a decision tonight. Um, Correct. So can, that will be in the record. We have 35 days from this evening, I guess. So I'm just asking, there's two more articles yes, from the were, interveners they, yep, that we yep. don't have to hear about tonight. We'll read right. about it. Right. Okay. So I'm okay. I know uh, Steve has a lot of expertise in the field, and I know that he kind of was insulted tonight, but I think uh, his reports are going to be just fine for us to read without a rebuttal. <laughs> okay, so Mr. Bilchek, what would you like to say? The reason why they're submitted uh, so late in uh, today the uh, applicant asked for an extension from last month's uh, hearing. At that point in time, uh, Mr. Logan's and Mr. Trinkus's reports, they had 50 days to respond. And then also 23 days for uh, Mr. Trinkus's uh, uh, report. The reports that were filed by the applicant, we only had 11 days and seven days to respond. I want to put that on the record because that's important. That's like the applicant is like, you know, blindsiding us. Oh, we got two new experts. Two new experts. That's important, Your Honor. I mean, uh, uh, Madam Chairman, this is like I said, we are an intervener and it's a legal entity. We have the right. And I just want to make sure that, you know, if we don't get the opportunity to make a uh, testimony, live testimony, and they have two new experts that have live testimony. I feel that's unfair, being that you have you can make that decision. But I do want to uh, touch one uh, one issue that was raised about the well, the neighbor's well at 42 Mill Road. There seems to be. I don't know who's telling the truth, uh, uh, Madam Chair. We got uh, entered into the record uh, a, a email from Mark Palick of the Department of Health stating he was unaware of the well at 42 Mill Road. Also, uh, Trent Joseph states he was unaware of the well at 42 uh, Mill Road. Now we have Mr. Ott saying, oh, he talked to Mr. Joseph already. 
I don't know, Your Honor. If when, this, it, when the application was filed, the site plan should have noted that there was a potential or a possible well 75 feet, at least 75 feet off the property. I've been in this business for 30 years. I've seen a lot of site plans. This is the first time I've never seen a well marked or a potential well marked. So if that fact, if the Department of, uh, uh, Department of Health is questioning this application, and so is the Department of uh, Health Department in the town of Madison, this application is incomplete. The site plan is incomplete. And you can't make, you, well, can't, you can't rule on something with an incomplete plan. Well, thank you. Um, luckily, we have 35 days to decide. And also, that sounds like a Department of Health issue that is not under our purview. So regardless of if there's a well or if there is not a well, that we are really looking at the wetlands and any impacts on the wetlands. However, given that we have 35 days, hopefully that will get sorted out behind the scenes at town campus. But, you're, but the, but the uh, evidence is closes tonight at the public hearing. So we have inconclusive site plan. And that's important. And you're saying that uh, they made a big issue that they got approval from the uh, Department of Health, state of Connecticut. This is the applicant. Well, it's well, really the... not something that we can sort through tonight and the public hearing needs to close tonight or we can run out of time. So I'm sorry, that's, and- But, but you, you realize there cannot be any further evidence produced or uh, made up on the record from the town of Madison or the state of Connecticut. But we do I have- Thank uh, you for your advice. <laughs> um, I am not a lawyer and I think we're just gonna continue with the public hearing. So um, because it is a public hearing, I see we still have people out in Zoom land, <laughs> probably I don't know, drinking lots of coffee or espresso, but if, so, so we've had public comment. Um, so if there is somebody new who would like to comment, we can allow public comment. If you have already commented and have something new to say, I can give you two minutes since you've already had a turn at a previous public hearing. So this is to accommodate any last um, public comment. And I am not a co-host, um, so I can't see who's got their hands raised. Attorney Shansky, are you still raising your hand? Okay. You, Madam Chair, yes, I was merely for the purpose of reminding the agency that Mr. Ott responded to the question about the well, explained his due diligence to the agency, and the design is approved by the DPH. Thank you. Um, all right, so Aaron, is that, a, is this, do we have new, can you tell if we have new people raising their hands? I have one individual in the audience uh, raising their hand that is um, Rob Marzatelli, um, okay. who I believe has spoken uh, at, at the public hearing previously. Um, so you can uh, best advise uh, Madam Chair, how um, you'd like to handle any new information? What happened? Okay. To, um, if we have, I just, uh, I just lost Rob here, um, and and see if he would like to uh, enter any new information. Are you agreeable to that? Uh, yeah. If there's new information, um, we have two minutes per person for repeat people. <laughs> Rob Marzatelli, you're you're unmuted. Um, are are you still looking to make make a comment? Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi. Thank you. I I don't recall speaking before, but thank you for the opportunity for speaking now. Um, in light of the fact that the uh, developer has had the two and a half hours preceding me to uh, talk. Um, I would appreciate uh, the opportunity to present some additional facts 
Um, one of which uh, Attorney Bilchak had mentioned with respect to the well, I think is very pertinent and important uh, in light of the fact that it, at least as I know, um, I'm not sure if any of the uh, agency has visited the, the site and observed the, um, the well. Um, but that is, of course, uh, important to not only the uh, resident on 42 Mill Road, but also to the uh, surrounding community with respect to um, the um, significance of the impact that it may have. Also, I just wanted to make sure and clear that Mr. Ott had previously had indicated that the square footprint was 7,800 square feet when in fact, maximum uh, square footage uh, is in fact 23,000 600 square feet as the evidence has presented in the documents that has been previously submitted by by him so i think that's very important to to make sure and understand that the the magnitude of the square footage is is significant um and and also um there are a number of other issues that um i think are important to to note um and, and some of which have been outlined in my um, uh, communication to the agency that I think is, is pertinent and um, feel that it, it should be um, stressed at this point. Um, I, I think one of which is with regard to the Connecticut statute should remind us of the importance of the inland and watercourse preservation, which is section 22A-36 that states um, and stipulates as well as in the Madison regulations that the pre preservation and protection of the wetlands and watercourses from random, unnecessary and undesirable uses, disturbances or destruction is in the public interest and is essential to the health, welfare, safety of the citizens of the state. So I just want to remind the agency of, of that, as well as my prior correspondence that I think is pertinent in this matter. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, I see there's another and I, um, member of the public. Um, yes, Madam Chair, uh, Brianna O'Neill. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for taking um, the time to speak with us tonight. I just wanted, we wanted to bring up um, the question of that the construction with 100 feet of the pond has been denied for projects before by neighbors. So why is this an exception is the first question and that the density is really an issue having 18 to 36 units on the on the corner given the, the the density in the area. So those are my two comments and a question. Thank you. Are the, uh, anybody else want to speak on the public? Um. I see Brianna O'Neill raising her hand again. Um, Brianna, did you have another question or comment or did you no. just accidentally raise no. your hand? <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, oh. One more, Madam Chair, uh, Steve Gancy. Hi, it's Steve Gancy, and I've sat in on every one of the public hearings, and I appreciate all the work that everyone's done um, to date in trying to come to the right answer here. I've owned property on Cottage Road for over 20 years. I enjoy that area on both Cottage and River. I still think from everything that I've heard, I'm concerned of the adverse impact of water quality and the impact on the wetlands. 
my concerns um, include those with respect to trying to mitigate the water runoff to the pond. And I'm still very concerned about the highly non-pervious parking lot and close proximity of the buildings from both Cottage Road and River Road, which was brought up on the, I think the first hearing. So while there is underground drainages that are going towards the pond, as was also discussed tonight, if you go back and listen to the original, the very first meeting, I don't think we've resolved the water drainage that's gonna set up on Cottage, on, on, um, on Cottage Road and on Mill Road with the very limited drainage systems we have on those roads. And I'm concerned with the frequency and severity of storms that we continue to see on the coastline and Madison in particular, when we get water in the ranges of one, two plus inches, it's quite severe and there's ponding. And I gotta believe that that has a significant impact on our wetlands and our wildlife. I'm still, having sat in all these meetings, I'm still, I'm not sure if anyone has truly convinced me that that pond does not run off to the Hammonasset River. I looked at the topography as a lay person and I've heard from both sides of this position and I am concerned about that. I'm also concerned from um, my layman's perspective of the content of ammonia, which is one of the primary forms of nitrogen that are going into what, what I'm gonna call the pond. And I'm being very objective and I would, as a, you know, as a, as a citizen of Connecticut for almost 40 years and um, someone that's very much appreciates nature and our ecosystem, I would, the decision that's being made is one where we must ask ourselves, will this change have an adverse impact on wetlands and the ecosystem? Thank you very much for thoughtfully listening to the public. And I also ask that the letter that was submitted while that as of 6 p.m. tonight, that it thoughtfully be evaluated and that folks that put hard work in have an opportunity to present it at the hearing before a decision is made. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to try to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Aaron, do we have, I thought I saw more people, but no? Yes, Madam Chair, um, uh, Attorney Shansky has her hand raised as well as uh, two members of the audience. Uh, one is um, shown as Deb and the second is Tom Sullivan. Um, both may have spoken uh, during previous hearings, um, but uh, they will have to identify themselves further. Um, um, okay, know for sure. <laughs> Attorney Shansky, is there something you wanted to? Madam Chair, I'll wait till after the public speaks. I just want to respond to the factual issues that those members of the public have raised. Okay. All right. Well, um, we can have, I think, one of, you can let whoever, Deb. <laughs> can, can you identify yourself for the record, please, Deb? Yes. Hi, it's Deb King. Um, couple of new points. One is I just wanted to mention that we just received the test results from the borings three business days ago. And that's why our reports came in today because our experts worked over the weekend to get those done. Uh, number two, I spoke with Matt Pollack, who is at the Connecticut State Department of Health this afternoon. And he said he knew nothing about the well on the abutting property. 
Um, number three is that when you read George Logan's report, please pay attention to the ammonia level of 4.62 near test pit B4, which is um, right near 41 Cottage Road and the septic system there. And then lastly, I, I just have to say, I think it's a little unfair for Steve Trinkus not to be able to speak after the comments that were made about him. So again, thank you. I know this has been a tremendous amount of work for all of you and we appreciate you listening to us. Thank you. Uh, Tom Sullivan is next. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, you're correct, um, Ms. Mannix. I, this is the second time I'm speaking and I appreciate the commission's opportunity to hear from the public again tonight. I would point out that the applicants were given their two and a half hours, so to give the public a few minutes, I hope isn't too much of a burden on the uh, commission's part. Um, aren't we the people that you serve as the taxpayers and shouldn't our voices be heard? Um, I'm really disturbed, uh, actually, in the last, at the close of the last meeting, one of the commission members mentioned that there, where was all the public and why was there no outcry? In fact, it, <laughs> there was outcry when, for, when 41 Cottage Road was developed. We were, we were never notified about by the Inland Wetlands Commission of the, the subject property uh, having to be developed on White Lake Lane. We did show up at the planning and zoning commission meetings and there was extensive outcry. We need our public servants to be responsive to the public's needs, not developers' needs. We, we have a vested interest in this. You've heard from the neighbors. We are deeply concerned. We've got uh, signatures on petitions. We've, got, we, we've, we've put expert testimony into the record. I, I mean, to, I've heard this commission on several occasions talk to people about putting deck posts in and having to hand dig them and they've given you know, other citizens of the town more, have, have disputed you know, adding in a deck or adding in a patio or cutting down trees more than something which is clearly gonna damage the ecology of our town. And we need our public servants to, to serve our public. The fact that, we, that you would scrutinize other applications with the degree of diligence that you have and not do, do that to this one, which, you know, clearly impacts the environment is beyond us. So we, the neighbors, appeal to you to please give this the care and diligence it deserves and please be attentive to the experts that we have hired to, to demonstrate that this will have an adverse impact on our neighborhood where we all live. Thank you for your time, Madam Chair. I thank you for your comments and your, you know, passion about where you live and wanting to keep it how you like it. Um, we have more people from the public and we are, no. you know, just to respond, we are, you know, I'm not timing you. So, I'm, you know, I, 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 we do want to hear from people and we are, you know, listening to your comments. Plus, we definitely have over 12 hours in, so we are dedicated to listening to everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Um, so the, Aaron, there's nobody- There are else. no more members uh, and attendees with their hands raised. Okay, Attorney Shansky. Thank you, Madam Chair. The preamble 22A36 to the Inland Wetlands Act, which is also recited in the first section of your regulations, indeed talks about the fragile, irreplaceable nature of inland wetlands and the need to protect them. But it ends with the invocation of the obligation of the wetlands agency to balance conservation and economic development. And this applicant has shown and gone to every inch of uh, the length it needed to go to to perform the level of study 
that established its eligibility for the permit and to line up the five professionals, each of whom has opined that not only will there not be any adverse impact on the single pond, but there, there will be improved conditions as a result of this development. The footprint of the building to which reference was made is 7,775 square feet that is set forth in Mike Ott's uh, reporting and shown on the site plan. Uh, with respect to the gentleman who expressed his concerns, we're sensitive to his concerns. Concerns are not evidence. Uh, and the issue, I have to say a word about this well. Uh, Mr. Ott, explain the due diligence that he performed in his design of this project. And we all received a copy of that letter this week with the photograph of a different season showing this wellhead. If somebody wants to come forward and say definitively that there's a violation, nobody has said that. They've only raised the specter of a problem. But my God has told you the care that he took in identifying the features that are governed under required distances under the public health code and designed to them. So we have an approval. Many of us have talked to Matt Pollack and uh, the state has signed off on this. And in the absence of any countervailing evidence, I think that's where we are. So again, we thank you for your time. Uh, this this uh, applicant has demonstrated its eligibility for the permit it seeks. It's going to be a beautiful development. And thank you. Madam Chair. I know you, you want to get this over and done with, but once again, uh, applicants making self-serving statements saying we spoke to uh, Matt, uh, uh, up at uh, the Department of Health. That's immaterial. We have we have documentation. We have court. We have email correspondence on the record that states that he was not aware. And now we have Attorney Shiansky saying, "Oh, he, you know, they approved it." Well, now they have second thoughts because they were not get provided all the information, and there was he, they basically the applicant uh, marked off on the application saying there was no conflict. There is a conflict. And even though that Mr. Ott says that he did this, he did that, it flies in the face of reason that we have Mr. We have, uh, the DPA saying one thing, we have Trent Joseph saying another, that they did not know anything about this well. It's important, uh, Madam Chairman. I, I understand it's important. Clearly it's important. Everyone is talking about it. But as I already said, and, and this is gonna go for you, Attorney Shansky. This isn't something we're gonna to solve tonight. Maybe you all can go talk to the appropriate person at town campus together and sort it out. It's actually not under our purview either. We are not making a ruling on this application tonight. And, and, and so there's nothing tonight that we can do about your dueling narratives on the well there just isn't so i i think we're going to move on from the well and recognize that there are divergent views and that regardless that's not under our purview that just it just isn't yes attorney shansky thank you madam chair there there's still no evidence other than that the system complies with the public health code. These are allegations. I'll leave okay. it at that. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So I, I think we're going to move on from the well, and 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 that's not something our agency would deal with anyway. So you can take that to whoever does deal with that, which is not us. All right. So. There are no more public comments. We've heard from everybody after three hearings. Um, for uh, the agency members, while this is still open, are there any lingering last questions you would like to ask anybody that's still here? No, no questions. No more questions. Other okay. than the ones I've asked, yeah. Okay, I would just like to say to Mr. Trinkus, I am sorry about um, 
the personal attacks on you at the beginning. And I hope that that doesn't happen anymore in our meetings because I think we can have conversations in a civil way. So with that, I will entertain a motion to close the I hearing. I move that we close the public hearing on application 2131, 35 Cottage Road. I'll second it. All in favor? Raise your hand, say aye. Jill. Jill. Aye. 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 All right, the hearing is closed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Kia. Good job tonight. Huh. Um, so as Aaron said, um, we have 35 days because we did get late breaking um, reports. Um, I think it's worthwhile. We, we obviously, I, you know, I did read through them quickly um, before our next meeting. I think you, you all should go back through and and look at those. I think especially um, relevant will be looking at the comments and then the rebuttal, you know, the back and forth that we have now um, two or three times. In were, were they were they emailed to UK Lola or uploaded? they were emailed to all of us but after it was like six six something and I I didn't see them until after the meeting had started yeah, so I kind of looked for them I didn't see them in mine okay well we'll make sure that everyone has them and they'll probably be uploaded they're not uploaded I I don't know if they're uploaded Aaron but they're not but the, but we'll, the information that was submitted this evening after regular business hours was not uploaded okay. um, because we were not in the office. <laughs> yeah, that's so okay. they were that's forwarded okay. to you in an email. Um, and I'm, I'm happy. Uh, those will be uploaded um, to the application documents tomorrow. Okay. Uh, so uh, I, I we I will. Done, but that's okay. Yeah. Okay, I, I will make sure that you you have those as well. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks. I apologize yeah. if you weren't on that. Would, uh, I I may have missed you. <laughs> I that's hope okay. not. That's I didn't okay. think I did, but that's okay. Um. Okay. So uh, yes. Um. Let's please. Everyone can read through, read all the information, and um. Hopefully, the well will get sorted out. Um in the time between now and our next meeting. Um, Aaron, is there anything else? I think, I mean, we have, I mean, there's a lot of comment and I, I, you know, if you haven't gone through the letters, it's worthwhile to go through all of the comment and, and before we um, meet again on this. Yes. So what will happen, uh, Aaron, if, if um, I mean, uh, KLO, if, um, Mike looks at that well and ends up having to move the leaching fields. Do they do they have to resubmit something or can we? Do you know what I'm asking? I don't, I don't know. Well, isn't that just like we? I mean, we get that a lot, right? We get these modified plans. I think he would just have to modify it and resubmit. But I don't think the whole thing would be resubmitted. Is that right, Aaron? You you can't. There's no new information that can come into the commission at this. Okay, so they, they would have to in the applicate, you know, in, in their um, in this stage of of the application process. Okay. So that that's something. Um, well, then that that, that then they have um, to. I think, as you indicated, um, is not under the purview of of this commission. Yeah, except if he has to move the leaching fields, then that's a different situation, right? Or. or Am I wrong? I might be wrong. I don't, I don't well, want to I, extend this. I, I think that depends on, on the outcome of, of their discussion. Um, yeah, so okay. if uh, clearly if, if there are changes to be made, that would likely come after uh, a decision. Is yeah, rendered by they'd the have to withdraw and reapply. Um, just to, to bring the agency's attention, the, the applications, uh, as you're aware, the documents for the applications are currently tied to an agenda. Uh, so as you're looking through information, uh, this evening's agenda um, does have all of the application materials on that. This is all available for your viewing. Um, and as Kalo indicated, um, you should review these documents. Um, we tried as a staff to sort out the information as clearly as possible with initial application submission uh, materials. Yeah, that was helpful. Uh, 
uh, intervener submissions in a folder, uh, correspondence that was received prior to the opening of the public hearing in another folder, um, and then any correspondence that has been received uh, since the public hearing uh, was opened, I believe. Um, this might, Aaron, this might be net, and separate, separating them into folders was very helpful. For me, it would be helpful if when they upload them, if they date the documents in the in the document name, you know, some of them have dates, a lot of them don't. And it yeah, just, I, I it would just help me figure out which ones I've already seen and which ones I haven't seen. I don't know whether that's asking too much or not, but. Well, some of them have that, but a lot of them don't. And then it is it is hard to go, to realize what you've already looked at and what's new. Um, I don't know, that's, I, that's just renaming a file. I don't know if that's possible or not. Um, yes, the ones that do not have a date, if they are dated materials or dated received, um, those could be um, relabeled a, a little clearer. Most of them that are uh, revised plans or more recent yeah, 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 yeah. do have dates associated with them um, in, in the information. I think um, one of the thoughts that we may have had um, for uh, this evening, I know the hour is late, um, but the commission, you do have the ability to do some deliberations for a uh, little more discussions this evening um, to uh, provide some feedback to staff as far as um, any of your thoughts, if you have some um, ahead of next, uh, our, our next meeting uh, so that staff can help um, you formulate some, some motions. Um, well, the only one I have is that, I don't know, this may be, jumping the gun a little bit, but I think the maintenance plan, Kayla Oil was on it in her questions. The plannings and the maintenance plan are a key part of this application. And it seems like there's going to be some staff time that's going to be required to monitor that and keep track of that. And I don't know, I'm just throwing it out there, something that we should think about how we can, you know, make sure that it happens. But, and I don't think we have to decide now. It's just something that that I would probably, that I was planning on bringing up next meeting, so. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, the NOMO area, you know, a lot of the the landscaping that was presented, the buffers, you know, that 25 foot buffer and um, all of that is, you know, that's great. But it, it does, it, it, and there's this detailed plan, but I didn't, you know, after five years, it's not clear who picks that up. Yeah, and and, and there's some middle requirements in the plan. There's, there's all kinds of stuff that the, the that they have to submit every year and do every year. And I don't, and, you know, they talk about, I think the plan mentions the town's wetland expert or what, I mean, I assume that's John. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not sure, but, you know, just, <laughs> looking through that plan and seeing if that's something that the staff, you know, that we want to take on or, you know, that we need to take on, I, you know, I, I don't know. So but anyway. I would think we could, we could add a condition that after the time period, the development contracts with the professional landscaper takes care of it. Yeah, I think my understanding, Aaron, is that if this is gonna be on the plans, that that is no mo. And that, it, so that's all, that that should follow the property, right? I mean, they have to do that. I mean, I, I guess my concern, and this comes up, I know, you know, this has come up in other applications where people want to use vegetation as stormwater management or whatever, is, you know, how do you enforce that with a different owner? Or how, how does that, how does that there, follow? There are mechanisms uh, on the planning and zoning end to ensure maintenance of stormwater uh, systems as well. Um, for example, uh, restrictive uh, covenant, you know, files on the land records, the stormwater maintenance plan, um, and, and that agreement um, that gets filed on the land records. From a planning and zoning 
end, that would be more appropriate. However, the commission does, as you indicated, have the option to add um, conditions of approval that require uh, maintenance uh, specifically. I, I think that was referenced both monitoring and maintenance. Right. Uh, but we can't do, so we can't make a condition that it goes in the land record that would have to be planning and zoning. No, you, you can. I mean, yeah, you, you can. I just, I just, I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out all the different options. It is, yep. It is the, the approved, um, it, it would be, you know, what, what the um, proposed site development plan included. Yes. Um, there are, there are ways to uh, in, ensure that whether it's through, um, language on the land records, um, bond requirements, things of that nature, we can kind of explore some of those options for you. Okay. Yeah, that, that we've used bonds in the, John Matthew, haven't we used bonds in the past, maintenance bonds in the past, made them by? Yes, we have, yes, we have. I forget how, how do those work? Do you, do you know? Was they post the bond and then we release it after a yeah. period of time or something? Usually. Exactly. Exactly. Usually you can do, you have an ENS control bond uh, requirement, and then you can also do, um, yes, a wetland buffer, you know, or, or landscape um, bond, and you can require that to be maintained for a certain amount of time after uh, installation for monitoring. I mean, that's the way to make it happen, tied to some money somehow, you know, so. Okay. Are there other, um, anything else that um, Aaron and, and John should be thinking about or we need to think about? Um, I'm sure it'll be helpful to read more thoroughly the late reports. I think Aaron should contact Tom Sullivan and ask him if he wants to be on the commission. We have openings. <laughs> <laughs> we yep. He sure we was. Have, we have several commissions that could use, <laughs> could always use. Uh, I'd like to say something to Keola. Keola? Yeah? Keola did a, you did a phenomenal job handling this application and handling all the comments. Uh, thank you. Well, got lots of, lots of, I think we're all a good team together. You get to do it again in two days. <laughs> oh, that's so fun. <laughs> Three days, I hope, right? Isn't it thir it's Thursday, right? Thursday. Oh, Thursday. I forgot. Oh. It's only Monday. I, I only have three half hour for that one after tonight. Yeah. Um, okay. So, okay. So I think, you know, for sure, um, read the new stuff. And we'll be um, thinking about all this material. Is there anything else? Yeah, Joe. Um, and Joe, and Joe, are you gonna? Are you going to be able to make it on the tenth? Uh, Joe. Oh, can't hear you again. I think that was strategic. <laughs> what would you do? Yes. Otherwise, we're not going to have a quorum. Okay. That's right. And you may have, as, as John had indicated earlier, um, or Kealoa, um, the Board of Selectmen did approve a new um, member to the agency who has not uh, yet been sworn in. Um, right. So I will, um, I know we may have. Uh, at least one application on Thursday that um, without Bob may not be able to have action um, taken on that. Yeah. So um, I'll, I'll reach out to our newest member and see if um, he may be able to get uh, sworn in and in attendance. Okay. Well, Joe just said he's going to be there. So yeah, he's going to be there. That's great. It's yeah. good to have a buffer. You never know. Yeah. Um, so that so that's great. Okay. Um, all right, anybody want to entertain a motion? I move we uh, adjourn tonight's meeting. I'll second. All right, all in favor? Aye. All right, I'll see you guys in um, three days. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thank you all. Good Have work. A good night.